basketball, volleyball, athletics, squash, etc. and other indoor games are made available on this campus. The institute has four well-equipped compact catamaran sailboats to give the students a glimpse of life on high seas. Together we share some daily nice moments of our life. With the aim to develop sturdy and healthy mariners, comfortable hostel facility serves them in the best way. The hostel buildings have television rooms, activity areas, and web gyms. The institute features excellent academic facilities. The institute has well equipped laboratory facilitating the principle of material testing, mechanics, hydraulics, electric control systems, electronic equipment and electric machinery. The world-class engineering systems on the campus, like Prabhu Vidya, High Voltage Lab, High Voltage Lab, Hazard Simulation Lab, Full Mission Simulators, etc., fulfill the requirements of aspiring mariners. Can you imagine some of these systems are almost a replica of the real shipboard equipments? This is an equal opportunity institute. The students are offered merit and need come merit scholarships worth over $160,000 per year. Additionally, many ship scholarships. As a student and an aspiring mariner, this is the most amazing and apt place I could have been. But the linking bridge between all these elements of the institute and the students is the faculty. Tulani Maritime Institute is guiding light for the proud future mariners. The professional and qualified full-time faculty leaves no stone unturned to instill pride, integrity, determination, humbleness, and in-depth knowledge about and maritime operations in the would-be marine officers. After all, it's more than just a love for swimming to make you equal when the sea presents its worst best. TMI has a glorious legacy of training the brightest aspiring seafarers. But why do students go through these four years of crueling training? To tame the seas and for admiration, respect and honor, which come with donning the uniform adorned with stars. It is a job worth toiling for. Some of these students go on to become the guardians of India's formidable coastline. The innovative internship come placements program at the Institute gives its students an edge over the others. The recruiting companies have no second thoughts on hiring students from the Institute. A majority of students enjoy a permanent employment with some of the top-notch national and international shipping companies. I believe that this is where the bright future of the shipping and maritime industry in India is assured. The journey, though, definitely does not end here. It is still a long way to go, and they have to prove their mettle. The canvas is huge, the path challenging. It has been rightly said that you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. That will surely not be a tough task for graduates from this institute. They have the strong foundation of training at one of the best maritime institutes in India. Any ocean, any ship is easy to fathom when your alma mater is Tulani Maritime Institute.
The sea might be as violent as it can be, the water infinite, and the waves intimidating. But all this become insignificant when a mariner dons his uniform. Conquering the high seas is no mean feat. Only those with a mighty heart and a steely resolve can accomplish that. Such extraordinary seafarers are made in Tulani Maritime Institute, located in Induri at Talagao, near Pune. The sprawling 100-acre campus is an endeavor by the Tulani Group with an illustrious tradition of establishing and managing higher education institutions. Dr. N.P. Tulani, Chairman Tulani Group of Companies and founder of Tulani Maritime Institute, strongly believes in higher education and its advantages. He credits his father for encouraging him to provide higher education in the country. I got the bug of uh, education from my father and it has continued ever since. Our vision at TMI is to be the preferred maritime education and training provider in the industry, meeting the highest global standards. This institute is one of the largest maritime educational centers offering grade one rated marine engineering and nautical science degree programs, postgraduate programs and other courses in collaboration with foreign universities as well. The degree courses are approved by the Directorate General of Shipping, Government of India, MLIT, Japan and MPA, Singapore. The BTEC Marine Engineering BSc Nautical Science degrees and the Diploma in Nautical Science are presented by the esteemed Indian Maritime University. There are hosts of other short-term courses like Electrotechnical Officers course, Command and Control course, and other safety-related courses. At TMI, our purpose is to achieve excellence in shipping and maritime technology. But what makes this possible and what creates world-class mariners? It is the holistic impact of the state-of-the-art campus and the overall infrastructure that renders the institute matchless. The institute sits in the laps of rural nature, which has enhanced its charm. The institute benefits aesthetically and academically thanks to a beautiful lake in its midst. The lovely meditation garden on the hill keeps a vigil on the lake. Swimming is an integral part of the training, which is adjacent to the clubhouse. Outdoor sports like football, cricket, basketball,
I request the cadets to kindly keep their phones on silent mode. I repeat, I request all the cadets to kindly keep their phones on silent mode. Please rise for the guest speakers. Kindly be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I'd humbly request you all to put your mobile phones on silent mode to avoid unnecessary disturbances. Thank you. The auditorium has three emergency exits in case of an emergency, one at the back and one on either side of the auditorium. Technology is the soaring exercise of human imagination which is progressively lifting the benchmark of possibilities. This is exactly what the participants showcased on the first day of TransTech, a day filled with eloquent speeches by the dignitaries and excellent papers presented with a spirit of healthy competition. Today, we move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you all to day two of the technical symposium TransTech 2022. Like every year, Solani Maritime Institute, in association with the Institute of Marine Engineers, Pune branch, and the Institution of Engineers, Pune Local Center, invites revered personalities in the maritime field for a one-of-a-kind exposure through their insights. This year, TransTech 2022 has the honor to have Mr. Prafil Kalankar, Director, SP Auto Engineering, as our guest speaker for today's proceedings. We warmly welcome Mr. Kalankar to TMI with a small token of appreciation. I would
would also like to take this opportunity to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Tanuja Khatavkar, Regional Coordinator, Pune, Virtual Labs Regional Center, IIT Bombay, with a token of gratitude. We are also delighted to have among us Professor Pushpadeep Mishra, Senior Project Manager, Virtual Labs, IIT Bombay. We warmly welcome Professor Mishra with a token of appreciation. Golani Maritime Institute was established in 1998 in Induri, Pune, Maharashtra. Among the lush green fields and mountains with a vision to produce the finest of the fine seafarers, not only in the country, but across the globe. The cadets in TMI are trained and groomed in all possible aspects of life, be it academics, sports, culturals, or discipline, you name it. The TMI cadets have been there and done that. Here on the screen, we present to you the corporate video of our legacy. The sea might be as violent as it can be, the water infinite, and the waves intimidating. But all this become insignificant when a mariner dons his uniform. Conquering the high seas is no mean feat. Only those with a mighty heart and a steely resolve can accomplish that. Such extraordinary seafarers are made in Tulani Maritime Institute, located in Induri at Talagao, near Pune. The sprawling 100-acre campus is an endeavor by the Tulani Group with an illustrious tradition of establishing and managing higher education institutions. Dr. N.P. Tulani, Chairman Tulani Group of Companies and founder of Tulani Maritime Institute, strongly believes in higher education and its advantages. He credits his father for encouraging him to provide higher education in the country. I got the bug of uh, education from my father, and it has continued ever since. Our vision at TMI is to be the preferred maritime education and training provider in the industry, meeting the highest global standards. This institute is one of the largest maritime educational centers, offering grade one rated marine engineering and nautical science degree programs, postgraduate programs and other courses in collaboration with foreign universities as well. The degree courses are approved by the Directorate General of Shipping, Government of India, MLIT, Japan and MPA, Singapore. The BTEC Marine Engineering BSc Nautical Science degrees and the Diploma in Nautical Science are presented by the esteemed Indian Maritime University. There are hosts of other short-term courses like Electrotechnical Officers course, Command and Control course, and other safety-related courses. At TMI, our focus is to achieve excellence in shipping and maritime techniques. But what makes this possible and what creates world-class mariners? It is the holistic impact of the state-of-the-art campus and the overall infrastructure that renders the Institute matchless. The Institute sits in the laps of rural nature, which has enhanced its charm. The Institute benefits aesthetically and academically thanks to a beautiful lake in its midst. The lovely meditation garden on the hill keeps a vigil on the lake. Swimming is an integral part of the training, which is adjacent to the clubhouse. Outdoor sports like football, cricket, basketball, volleyball, athletics, squash, etc. and other indoor games are made available on this campus. The institute has four well-equipped compact catamaran sailboats to give the students a glimpse of life on high seas. To 
together we share some really nice moments of our life. With the aim to develop sturdy and healthy mariners, comfortable hostel facility serves them in the best way. The hostel buildings have television rooms, activity areas, and well-equipped gyms. The institute features excellent academic facilities. The institute has well-equipped laboratories for demonstrating and teaching the principles of material testing, mechanics, hydraulics, electric control systems, electronic equipment, and electric machinery. The world-class engineering systems on the campus, like Prabhu Vidya, High Voltage Lab, Hydraulic Lab, Hazard Simulation Lab, Full Mission Simulators, etc., fulfill the requirements of aspiring mariners. Can you imagine some of these systems are almost a replica of the real shipboard equipments? This is an equal opportunity institute. The students are offered merit and need come merit scholarships worth over $160,000 per year. Additionally, many shipping companies also offer merit-based scholarships. As a student and an aspiring mariner, this is the most amazing and apt place I could have been. But the linking bridge between all these elements of the institute and the students is the faculty. The skilled and experienced faculty at Tulani Maritime Institute is guiding light for the proud future mariners. The professional and qualified full-time faculty leaves no stone unturned to instill pride, integrity, determination, humbleness, and in-depth knowledge about shipping and maritime operations in the would-be marine officers. After all, it takes more than just the love for swimming to make you equal when the sea presents its worst best. TMI has a glorious legacy of training the brightest aspiring seafarers. But why do students go through these four years of grueling training? To tame the seas and for admiration, respect and honor which come with donning the uniform adorned with stars. It is a job worth toiling for. Some of these students go on to become the guardians of India's formidable coastline. The innovative internship come placements program at the Institute gives its students an edge over the others. The recruiting companies have no second thoughts on hiring students from the Institute. A majority of students enjoy a permanent employment with some of the top-notch national and international shipping companies. I believe that this is where the bright future of shipping and maritime industry in India is assured. The journey, though, definitely does not end here. It is still a long way to go, and they have to prove their mettle. The canvas is huge, the battle challenging. It has been rightly said, that you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. That will surely not be a tough task for graduates from this institute. They have the strong foundation of training at one of the best maritime institutes in India. Any ocean, any ship is easy to fathom when your alma mater is Tulani Maritime Institute. Now, I would request Dr. Sanjeev Kanungo, Principal of TMI, to deliver the lecture. Okay, okay, good morning. Uh, okay, uh, a very good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to the second day of Transpect 22. I would uh, 
permit me to welcome in a different fashion today, I would be welcoming again the judges, uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar, Mr. Bhatt, Bhatt and Captain Krishnaswamy, who have been with us since yesterday, they will continue today. And uh, welcome to the students from outside this uh, institute. Uh, I, I, un I understand that the people from HIMD, from Gate System, so thank you so much for coming. I, I welcome the participants from colleges who are with us in the world, my dear students and colleagues. I had this privilege of uh, visiting one of the industries in, in our nearby Takan area. The gentleman deals with uh, very high precision uh, plastic automobile components. Uh, one of the highlights of the visit was in addition to the complexities of the parts which he makes, he had a very good <coughs> array of histograms, pie charts, which at a glance was able to tell him and his people that where they were yesterday, where they are today, and where they will be tomorrow. like this, people like him should be here. Tomorrow. Welcome, Mr. Kalankar. In fact, I had uh, on my on my visit and uh, following my visit, I had uh, talked to our MR. I said, "You must visit him. You must interact with him, because we also need to have such at a glance standing of things, which we should be able to peruse and should be able to examine ourselves." TMI <coughs> has been on the cusp of uh, development, but the COVID was a big hindrance for us. But nonetheless, TMI internal team was able to rise up to the occasion and within the shortest possible time was able to adapt to the online education system. And in this mode, there are some more faculty who are innovative in nature who clicked on virtual labs and said <laughs> that they can continue the practicals without a glitch. Then started the idea of how do we contribute and how do we participate. This thought process uh, ignited the minds of my team here and they started on the process of, on the roadmap of developing or engaging with VLabs. There's a lot which can be done in this board. Boys and girls who are youngsters here who have who should know this, that real life practicals are important, but real life practicals, if they are augmented by virtual labs, they add to the knowledge base, they reduce uh, wastage, and they can give you a, your freedom to exercise more experimental without any additional cost. So for this, uh, I welcome Professor Tanuja Thakwakar, the Regional Coordinator, Virtual Labs uh, Center, IIT Bombay, and Professor Pushdip, uh, Pushpadeep Mishra, Senior Project Manager, Virtual Labs, IIT Bombay. Welcome. For the benefit of the guest speakers, let me tell you that the Transtech uh, was started with the idea of permitting students from various engineering colleges to present their skills in paper presentations 
and making models. Uh, the idea of TransTech was to enable the students from various colleges to interact with our students. By interacting with students of various colleges, we learn a lot. Every college, had, every college has certain strengths. This is exhibited during the students' presentations. The event is organized in association with the Institute of Marine Engineers, Pune, and the Institute of Engineers, Pune Local Center. Uh, the industrial revolutions have transformed our uh, technological milieu and the fourth industrial revolutions has made blurred boundaries between the physical, digital and the biological worlds. You have the internet of things, you have the AIs, all these are going to change the life of the professionalism and the working style. So we need to be abreast with that. Probably yesterday we heard and we'll hear some more today that how the young mind are getting, adapting to this and how we as teachers should be making you trained to adapt to this. My uh, heartfelt congratulations to Mr. Anirudh Kumar and uh, to have conducted the TransTech 2002 at this point of time very well. We have a new addition this time. We have the quiz competition for the in the maritime sector so that you add some value to the transtex and uh, I wish that it continues further and we should be able to add more value to these forums. Thank you very much. God bless you, Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir, for your words. Being the large scale event that it is, TransTech provides everyone an opportunity to display a technical array of their talents. Like every year, TMI organizes a video making competition, attracting positive competition among the participants and saving one winner. Presenting to you the official video for TransTech 2022 by Cadet Harsh Sharma of second year ME.
I think. I think that was brilliant. You can give that a round of applause. <laughs> Makes you really optimistic about the future. Okay, um, our first guest speaker for this session, Mr. Praful Kalankar, is the director at SP Auto Engineering. He's a mechanical engineer with over 26 years of experience in the automotive industry. His experience ranges from fields like quality system management to manufacturing and project management and supply chain management. In 2014, Mr. Kalankar set up his own business after having served several years in the automotive industry. His business has three verticals, which are manufacturing, logistics, and management consultancy. He's gone through various management training programs in India and internationally. His consultancy provides a total solution in terms of establishment of quality systems, and some of the areas they work in include ISO and IATF quality system implementation and certification, training on soft skills and behavior skills like quality systems, personality development, problem solving techniques, TPAP, APQP, preparation for VDA 6.3 implementation, etc. The list is really exhaustive. Um, existing systems, ex up upgradation and monitoring and improving overall organization KRA, establishment of operation and finance MIS, plant level structured improvement programs through various modules like 5S, green productivity, machines and quality management. Like I said, the list is very exhaustive. I would now like to invite Mr. Kalankar to deliver his talk on quality, on total quality management. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, <coughs> first of all, I would like to thank Tolani Management to invite me here to deliver speech on TQM. Uh, basically, uh, uh, introduction has been already covered all the things uh, before this. So first of all, because I'm not going to tell you anything different, basic, basic things I'm going to tell you. How the theoretical things has to be implemented in the practical. That means every industry, and I strongly believe that, ki theory has to be implemented on the shop floor of every industry. Then and then only we will get the best desirable results. That is the only objective of this session. And uh, 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 I think I am having uh, 30, 40 minutes here to deliver my speech. But I would like to cover most of the things, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, TQM, total quality management. So total, total quality management, uh, this terminology is not a very, you know, different. But there are a lot of techniques are coming. Day by day, it is changing. It's a thoughts. New thoughts are uh, coming uh, in the industry. And uh, quality, because in order to understand the totality of the TQM, we have to understand the terminology quality. Quality of the service services, quality of the product. So that quality may be in terms of reliability, the quality may be in terms of sustainability. So these are the two important things which we are going to cover in today's session. Basically, this presentation uh, will contain uh, what is TQM. First of all, we will see okay, exact what is the definition of the TQM, principles of TQM, and then if we implement this in a systematic approach, systematic way, then what will be the benefits of TQM in the industry Re and requirements for successful implementation of the TQM in any industry.
basically total quality management is a customer oriented techniques basically and it's a process for continual improvement by adopting a uh, lot of uh, new things on the shop floor but it is a systematic approach towards the quality that is all about tqm total quality management is a management approach that seeks to provide long term success by providing unparalleled customer satisfaction through the constant delivery and quality services actually this concept is not the responsibility uh, to achieve the quality is not the responsibility of individuals or a, 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 a single person this is the responsibility of everybody whoever are working in the organization or in the team that is it creates the working culture in such a way that ki there will be a uh, there will be a system and process oriented approach tqm is considered a customer focused process that focuses on consistently improving business operations it strives to ensure all associated employees work towards the common goals of improving product or service quality as well as improving the procedures that are in place of production tqm is not only related to the manufacturing sector but it is related to the all services service segment also total quality management process is the ongoing process it is not the one time process this has to be inbuilt in our working culture that is the overall objective of the tqm if we implement the tqm in a structured way in any industry the your supply chain managements will be smoothened automatically then the overall quality of the product will enhanced to the extreme level after that your the cost of poor quality will also be reduced drastically and at the same time your customer satisfaction will be highly effective now we will see the principles of tqm there are lot of principles that means but basically we are going to see this most important principles of the tqm first is focus on customer that is i already told you this is not the responsibility of single process oriented concept because whenever you are going to start any activity you have to have a very systematic approach it will start from the planning and ends with the monitoring monitoring all the activities you must have heard the pdca cycle plan do check and act this is a very important concept which plays an important role in the tqm that means when you are looking at the customer customer should be the first priority because our business is sol solely depend upon the customers your customer should be delighted and he will not be delighted only one parameter or two parameters there are several aspect which is impacting on the customer satisfaction at the same time the customer satisfaction is not <coughs> only depend on the activities which we are carrying out on the shop floor in our industry or in our area <coughs> but at the same time we have to be very much focused with the activities that is you know the external activities <coughs> that is supporting activities which we are getting the support from our suppliers also <coughs> then service relationship with the internal customers i think you must be familiar with the customer concept customers is not always with the external customer only but there are internal customers also because unless and until we understand we recognize internal customer concept we cannot satisfy the end customer end customer is always one customer that is the end user that is the end customer but in the industry or in the in our uh, working area everybody is a supplier and customer to each other so that concept has to be kept in our mind <coughs> before going to start any activity how my customer that is the next operation will be satisfied that has to be understood by individuals so that is called a service relationship with the internal customers our next operation holder or next customer should be happy internal customer should be happy that has to be kept in our mind customer driven standards whatever we are doing in the operation uh, in the process that is for the customers end customers 
because the time is very less, that is why this, this uh, session will not be interactive session, I feel. So APQP, that is Advanced Product Quality Planning. APQP concept is a very important concept in any industry, any service industry. That is again related with the PDCA cycle. Before going to start any activity, we have to have a structured plan on the paper. Without planning, if we are going to start any activity, there are 100% chances of getting failure. Because we are not, because there is not a, uh, you know, that is structured thought, which is, which has to be put on the paper. So first of all, we have to do the planning in a very systematic way. So APQP, that means APQP, this concept is always used in the new project. There are various types of gates, basically. First gate is the design concept. Whenever we are going to start any activity, any development, that time we have to start with the planning approach. And the customer's requirement, what is the customer exact work, uh, customer requirement? That has to be identified in a very structured way. That is, whether it is feasible to us or not, what are the risk analysis, it's a very small, small parameters has to be considered during this process. Then the, fa the last is, that is never compromise on quality. Quality is never compromise because the quality should, quality is not a separate things, separate requirement from the customer. It should be the inbuilt quality in your service or in your product. Then employee ownership. I already told you that this is the responsibility of total team. Everybody, if you look at this, uh, this one, uh, this slide, everybody is working separately, but they are busy in their own activities. TQM requires the involvement of every team member to ensure that complete quality control is offered at every level. That means that quality control or that quality assurance concept should be involved at each and every level of the organization. This activity. So that is that means your sweeper is also a play, plays an important role in the quality. From sweeper to the top management, top management should driven this activity basically. And if you drives the activity in a very systematic way, you will get the exact desirable result at the end of the day. And TQM does not focus on a single department because the goal is to provide customers with a great experience from every level of the organization. The employee involvement, how it will, how it will be groomed? There will be required extensive training because everybody has to involve in each and every activity. So extensive training is required in order to grow this activity. There has to be a team formation, excellence team has to be there. Team means their roles and responsibility has to be defined. What will be their care towards the common goal? If there is a team, that means there is a common goal. To achieve that goal towards quality, we have to have a individual role and responsibility. And at the same time, monitoring of the activities and their results, that is very, very important. If that activities are, we are doing and we are not getting the result as per the desired uh, thought process. So then we have to go for the, again we have to review the cycle and again follow the same level. That means it's a cycle basically, PDCA cycle. Measurement and recognition, that I already told you. We have to measure our activities in such a way that whether these activities are giving the des res desired result or not, that we have to analyze. Then we have to follow some suggestion schemes so that this activity will again be strengthened. It's a process based. The next principle of the TQM is process based. TQM focuses on the creation and implementation of processes that provide organizations with the ability to find success and repeat it. Quantifying success and defining the steps taken to get there are essential for successful implementation of TQM. Thinking about the process, because once we have done the activity, it is not the one-time activity. And your every process should not be depend on the individuals or that operators or that 
manager. So it has to be a process driven basically. So for that, there has to be a thought process. Ki how the process will be there, how the flow will be there, what are the steps we will have to follow to complete that process. That is very, very important. And process means we have to derive the steps to get the desired result. And every steps will be monitored. Then handling of the process is equally important. That means process flow diagram. You must have heard the SOP, standard operating processes. Any operations when you are going to do, there has to be SOP in every organization. If SOP is there, that means we are not dependent on the person. We are dependent on the processes. That means which is laid down on the, uh, in the industry. Quantifying success and defining the steps taken to get there are essential for successful implementation of TKO. Processes, which has to be a result-oriented one. System integration. TQM strategies revolve around leveraging every asset available to the company. This is best achieved through system integrations that combine disparate parts of the organization into a single well oil machine working in a complete synergy. Actually, system integration means everything should be, there has to be a smooth flow of the operation. There should not be the intervention of anybody in order to create a smooth flow. So in that way, the, your process, how you design the process, that is more important in the system integration concept. Then identify the supporting application. If it is distracting or it is disturbing your main activity, then we have to think about the uh, supporting applications also. We have to identify the required infrastructure or uh, we can say that the uh, required uh, uh, resources. Then in terms of man, that means we have to identify, in many cases, we have to identify the uh, training needs also. If there is a training required, special training is required to perform the particular activity, that time we have to identify the training needs. Communication. The communication TQM, in TQM practices, the communication is very, very important. You must have uh, noticed that there are in a, there may be some of the member who hide the problems. There should not be the hiding the problem. If problem is there, that problem has to be placed on the surface. And every member is supposed to interact within a team with very transparent. Problem means there has to be an approach of YY analysis. Why the problem has arise? Where has arise? Who has noticed? When it has arise? How it has to be, that means you have to ask five W, five Y questions to yourself. Then you will come to the root cause. Ki what is the problem, exact problem? We should not find out the solution on the basis of our gut feelings only. There has to be a, there has to be a very systematic approach towards finding out the solution. Unless and until we find the root cause, how we will go to the uh, solution? it will be very uh, difficult. That is why there is a fishbone diagrams concept in the viva analysis. We have to identify all the potential causes, all the potential, uh, this one, failures, so that each and everything will be think in a systematic way. Communication should be in open forum. It should be because we have to educate the people how to communicate to each other how to uh, place the problem, how to uh, do the problem definition also. Many times, because of the wrong problem definition, we will not able to reach the root cause. Many times it happens. Now, uh, if we are, that means we will discuss with you because uh, uh, I'm having my own uh, four factories, manufacturing factories. One factory is uh, related to the painting process, uh, spray painting that is uh, in, in interior and exterior parts. So painting is a very special process. Unless and until you paint the 
part and when it comes out of the uh, oven, then you will come to know the quality of the product. That is why it is called as a special process. So before, before starting of the process, we have to take extra precautions. Extra precautions in terms of the paint which you are using, what are the processes you are doing with the paint, that means what are the process parameters you have to follow, what are the process controlling method, that is pressure, temperature, then uh, you know, uh, that is viscosity of the paint. These are various lot of processes. So that means this is the process designing approach. The process designing approach does not tell you only to design the process, but at the same time, we have to be very particular about the parameters which has to be controlled during the process so that it, the final result which is coming out of the process, it will be exactly as per the desired results. So there is a quality plan also for this. Quality plan, what is quality plan? Quality plan means we have to have a, every parameters has to be listed down. Quality parameters related to the product. That means what is the exact requirement of the final product. At the same time, what is the requirement of the process, process parameters? If viscosity, but how much it should be? There has to be a clear cut sheet which will be indicating you that everything is available on the sheet. That means any blind person can process the uh, things and you can get the good results. It will not be uh, only depend on the person. So that is why the quality plan, quality parameters that has to be decided uh, uh, at initial stage. It should be data driven. Data driven means unless and until we don't have data, uh, 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 we doesn't have data, data should speak the actual status. Many times we discuss on the gut feelings. Team comes together, X person will tell you, yes, there might be these, these reasons. Second will tell you, this, this, there might be. It is not the systematic approach, it is the gut feeling only. You cannot find out the root cause in this process. There has to be a very systematic approach. And I feel that uh, uh, the next, I'm going to take the lot of sessions in your uh, college. And uh, in that, I'm going to tell you the exact uh, implementation, how we are going to implement on the, our shop floor. So we have implemented a lot of things. That is PPAP, APQP concept, Kaizen concept, on day-to-day -day basis. Recognition of the Kaizans, what, are, what should be the, everything should be in a systematic approach. Then and then only you will get the results. <coughs> Continual improvement process. TQM is not a one and done process. Perfection is impossible. So it must always be pursued to get the organization as close as possible to it. Continuous improvement, when you can uh, see the improvement, if there is no measurement, there has to be a measurement of each and every parameter. Then and then only it is possible to count where th that means where you are, we are going. So that means measurement is the first technique. Then there has to be excellence team. Cross-functional process management has to be there. Attain, maintain and improve standards. So this is very, very important. That is principle of uh, uh, continual improvement. What is, uh, I think there, there is a difference between continuous and continual. We always believe on the continual improvement. We should not go straight directly. We should go, then there has to be a uh, sustenance part. So that we will, there will be sustenance. After that again we have to grow, then again sustenance. So that everybody will understand the process, results, and whatever things we have done, that means how we can sustain it. Sustenance part is very, very important in the industry. This month we have achieved zero PPM and next month again, uh, uh, thousand PPM. That means the result in the first month, it is by luck. It is not, this result is not by the process, design process. So that means the sustenance part is very important. So you grow sustenance, grow sustenance. That is called as a continual improvement. And that this continual improvement is very, very important in the industry. 
there are a lot of benefits, but out of that benefits, uh, we have picked up three uh, major benefits are there uh, uh, from the TQM. TQM will increase the awareness of quality culture in the organization. You must be aware that there are a lot of, uh, you must have heard the name cost of poor quality. Cost of poor quality is not only the cost of bad products. Cost of poor quality include the cost of inspection also. That means our processes are not so robust, which is manufacturing the good product from your, from your processes. That means we are not confident about our product, which are manufacturing through the processes, design processes. So that means we are applying the inspection process there. So inspection is an extra activity. Customer will not pay for that inspection. So it's a muda. Muda is a Japanese word. It's a wastage. Wastage of time, wastage of resources, wastage of money. So that means poor of quality is always count as an inspection process also. Then the, that means the second poor of quality is the bad products, bad quality, which we are getting from the process. That is the uh, cost of poor quality. Customer communication, customer will raise the complaint, then we are uh, transportation, th all this comes under the uh, cost of poor quality. So that is why the cost of poor quality is always in the multiples of the manufacturing of the, uh, cost of the manufacturing of the products. So that is why there is one concept that is first time right every time. Whenever you are manufacturing the product, it should be first time right and every time it should be right. That is the concept on which we have to work. A special emphasis on teamwork will be achieved. Here in this process, if we are going to implement the TQM in our organization, their culture built, teamwork culture built. Teamwork culture is a very, very important. If we want to achieve extra um, uh, for our organization, TQM will lead commitments towards continual improvement, continuous improvement and continual improvement. Team ko pata lagega ki yes, mera commitment hai, mujhe karna hai. So that commitments improved if you start implementing the TQM. Requirement for successful implementation of TQM. If suppose we want to implement the TQM, what are the things we need? Quality improvement in all aspects. Must be everyone's job in the organization. Commitment from everybody. It is must in the TQM. There are some of the, uh, this one, you know, that the qualities which is required. First of all, we should have the attitude. Our attitude should be towards quality. Mera attitude hi rahega, to I will not able to focus or concentrate on this activity. Aur mera khud ka commitment chahiye. Sabse pehle to interest chahiye. Interest starts with the interest. Whenever you are going to start any activity, you have to have an interest in that particular field. Results will come automatically. If you are doing any activity without interest, that means something is wrong. So my suggestion is, uh, my suggestion is to uh, every student, ki you have to start with your, uh, this one, uh, 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 interest. Whatever you are doing in any field, you have to do with the interest. Then comes attitude. There has to be attitude, winning attitude. There has to be a goal, common goal. Ye goal, ye mujhe, ye mujhe achieve karna hai then you can achieve every, everything. Then there should be a proper training to effect the changes in attitude and culture. Culture always comes from the trainings, slogans, uh, uh, you know that there are a lot of things which can be implemented. We are implementing a lot of things in our industry. That is every month we are conducting communication meeting. In that communication meeting, we discuss about what are the last month achievement? What are the last month failures? What are the last month customer's feedback? Who, who was the best employee of the last month? Who has contributed a lot towards the quality? All that things we discuss with our employees. And we recognize their efforts, whatever they have contributed in the last month. Continuous improvement. This is the requirement of the successful implementation for TQM. Then customer focus, control. I already discussed with PDCA cycle. Ensure monitoring and control checks for any, de any deviation 
from the intended course of implementation. Thank you. This is all about uh, our TQM. TQM is a very, uh, uh, this one, you know, systematic journey where we can implement very small, small things in our organization. If we want to achieve a good results in terms of cost effective, in terms of customer satisfaction, in terms of, you know, the cust uh, employees motivation also, we are, we can motivate the employees also in this case. We can motivate all the students. And this is very important from the safety point of view. Safety, whenever you go, whenever you work, this is applicable in, our, in your human life also. This is very, very important concept, quality management. Thank you. One more thing I would like to advise all the students. Before leaving this organization, because after this education, uh, you are going to join somewhere, okay? So first of all, you have to understand ki what is the expectation from your employer, from your organization, from you. That, is, that has to be understood by you. Unless and until you understood, you understand the what is the exact expectation from the uh, organization you will not able to perform by your own. So that is very, very important. You have to understand all the things. That means what is the company's common goal, how you are going to contribute towards that. That has to be uh, think deeply. You can ask me any questions on this topic. ISO 9001, it is, you know that it is the process oriented, basically. It's a very, this one. But this, this approach is customer oriented approach. This is the exact difference. ISO 9001 process is nothing but it is a, you know, a systematic uh, let down the procedure. But we have to follow it in that way and we have to monitor it so that we will come to know the exact result of the processes. Right. Uh, but this Japan, Sony company now lagging behind. Uh, what will be the reason? Means I am simply said TQM is a failure. Yeah, what I will. I, I will explain you. Uh, actually, you know the adoption, adoption of the new things that is very very important in today's competitive age. You must have heard the name Murphy. Anybody knows name Murphy? Murphy was a very good brand, but it is vanished completely. Ambassador, you know the ambassador? Ambassador was not a bad car basically. It was a very good, good company. You must have heard the uh, Kodak. Kodak was a very big name. Lot of employees were working with this company, but these companies has not adopted the new things as per the time, and they have vanished. The same things, we have to adopt the new things day by day. Now we are talking about the TQM today. We have to, TQM that can be implemented by many ways, very simple ways. Uh, two, uh, three months back, I was delivering one lecture in College of Engineering, Amrauti, on Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a methodology. In India, Many people doesn't believe on Six Sigma because it takes time to analyze the data, to compile the data, and you know to find out the solution finally. It takes the time. People doesn't believe in that. But many companies, still there are many companies who believe on the processes, systems, and they follow it. They achieve the results. I mean to say, this is the time we have to adopt the new things. Now you talk, uh, we, we will talk about the Samsung. Five years back, Samsung was on the top, but now Samsung is not there. That means Samsung is behind that. That means many companies, because the lot of companies has adopted the new technology. 
at a right time in a right speed that is very important and that is why sony is also lagging behind like that so this is very important actually speed matters new technology matters uh, are you satisfied with my answer yeah it was the growth and sustain growth sustain that, right and uh, can you uh, tell us some practical uh, step on it why not uh, straight uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, growth is appreciated i will explain it now suppose my company today's my company is of 100 people okay my company is 100 people company and it's a 100 crore company all this one you know that the the culture and the infrastructure that is created accordingly to create a revenues of 100 crores okay but if suppose i am planning to increase the sales by 100 crores every year every year that is not possible because there has to be some time if you can grow you have to see you have to check whether whatever steps we are taken we have taken whatever steps we have taken to improve from this level to this level whether all the steps are performing in a right way or not that has to be checked and we have to see their performance results now if somebody uh, recruited today we see we judge his performance for one year two year we are giving the time now for the uh, this one uh, measurement and uh, uh, this one uh, what we can say that measurement and uh, performance appraisal so that means we have to give some time and we have to analyze the processes so that we can analyze we can find out some difficulties also some problems also in that case so that we can take some corrective measures during this and again we have, we can see the result of that the uh, processes so that is why the sustenance part is important and we have to an, uh, uh, analyze the sustenance part as well as we have to monitor it for a uh, some time that is why the conti continual improvement is always works in any industry okay yeah. okay uh, thank you my time is already over i have taken uh, more time actually thanks sir we are genuinely grateful for the time and valuable input you have shared with us today and therefore we'd like to present you a small memento as a token of our thankfulness on behalf of everyone at tolani maritime institute i request captain manoj hirkane to please do the honor thank you sir for doing the honors good morning everyone i hope all of you enjoyed the technical talk by mr prafull kalankar now let us start with the second technical session of the day for this session we have two guest speakers now let me take this opportunity to introduce our first guest speaker of the day uh, of this session mr Pr uh, pushpadeep mishra is a senior manager working with virtual labs iit bombay he plays a role in outreach development and community engagement for v labs he believes in working at the grassroots level this mainly involves interacting with students teachers and identifying problems and challenges faced in academic setting his focus has always been on working out optimal solutions to teach roll out and content development for v labs his work demands to have a blend of leadership technical managerial and community skills he aims towards reducing redundancy toil and increasing efficiency for a given task good good work ethics along with culture of continuous learning and improvement 
is what he believes in. At IIT Bombay, he's involved with various teams in life sciences, education, technology, innovation, and healthcare. He has an affinity for learning new technology, leadership, practices, cloud, IoT, and software and hardware-based product development. Sir, we are looking forward to your guidance on VLabs. So without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Pushpadeep Mishra to deliver his talk. Very good morning to all of you here. Thanks to the Tolani Maritime Institute Management, uh, all the faculty members uh, for inviting me and uh, hosting me. Uh, it was a very warm welcome and the uh, warm hospitality. Good morning to all uh, young boys and girls. Uh, it looks a very action-packed event at uh, your institute and I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, before I proceed, I would like to thank the previous speaker on giving a very good insight on total quality management in fact, this is what uh, internally our team has also learned and we have been implementing, and uh, which is uh, uh, why, because uh, we have come to this uh, uh, level and uh, we have received, we have achieved very, uh, various milestones uh, uh, by implementation of such uh, quality management programs. So, uh, moving ahead with uh, virtual labs. So, before I proceed, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, first of all, why do you think we need a lab? I think most of you will uh, answer this, is to actually test the theoretical concept. So whatever you have learned in your academics in the classroom, there must be a curiosity amongst you to go out there in the lab, interact with the gadgets, that is have a familiarity with the hardware, and see whether whatever has been taught, how does it implement in uh, in practice. But then, immediately let me ask you a question. How much of you, of this you think, is you actually achieve at the end of the day? Well, to achieve this, there is a system, there is a process. What you see in front of you is called as Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy is a part of pedagogy. A pedagogy is a science of teaching and learning where you introduce a concept to the student or to the learner at a very basic level, where you just even allow them to recall the things that they have learned in the theory. And designing the level of difficulty, introducing them to challenges so that their cognitive level or the thought process increase and their learning experience is elevated to a level where they can analyze the results, they can evaluate, and end up creating their own problem statements and solving challenges. Now, how much of, you, of this do we actually think uh, we achieve in the practical labs that we do? So, this is a very ideal condition when you go to the top level of the pyramid and talk about creating something. Now, at IIT Bombay, we feel that an ideal lab would be something our student team is given, a, assigned a concept to design, to come up with problem statements, to solve this problem statement, instead of just directly going to the lab, push them towards a workshop, let them try to find out what are the components they need to assemble to solve that particular challenge, instead of giving some regular fixed apparatus. Let them generate the data, so data, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, the data speaks a lot. From data, you can analyze, you can evaluate, and, and you can claim that this whatever was taught in the theory is actually uh, can be achieved in practical. 
and let them then dismantle and store it away so that the next group of students can come in. So if you try to correlate with your childhood, remember a concept, a game called as mechanics, right? So in mechanics, you had uh, this concept where, uh, I mean, just try to think the level of engagement. You just pick up a toy from a store, a ready-made toy, maybe a car, a bus, train, or whatever it is, and just hand it to the, uh, to the uh, child. He will play for 10 minutes, one day, two day, then they will just leave it like that. But then, and it, it is a very fancy looking toy, right? You have all the lights, all gadgets inside that, all fancy things. But then you give the mechanics and you can immediately see there is a curiosity in the uh, child to try to look at the picture and try to assemble exact thing. Now this may not look very appealing as compared to the ready-made product that you have given. But see the level of engagement and see the level of uh, the have assembled a rig. They feel proud of themselves that, okay, they could achieve something. They come running to their parents and uh, try to show them, see what I have made. Okay, even if there is a wing of uh, a helicopter is crooked or something, but it's still uh, there's a sense of uh, achievement that is very important towards the learning process. And this is what we think uh, the ideal lab should be. It is not just implementing or just replicating whatever you have been learning in the theory by some ready-made uh, experimental setup, but to try, think, and assemble your own experimental setups, experiment, collect data, and then uh, uh, let the next batch of students do the same. But the, there are some problems with the existing physical labs. In fact, these are limitations that uh, at uh, uh, not every institute has very good uh, lab setup. And even if they have, the availability of that is quite limited. Uh, it is very expensive to run uh, the lab environments and uh, repetition of, therefore, the experiments becomes a challenge. Often a student gets to interact with a, a lab setup just once in an academic setup. Okay, you remember the, you recollect that uh, saying that practice makes man perfect. Now if, you ask, if I ask you how many times have you taken the same lab concept repeatedly? Okay, so unless you do that, you won't be able, able to achieve the quality. So virtual lab is something that uh, can allow you to uh, uh, do that. So that is a limitation of the physical lab. And uh, at times it is very hazardous as well. So because if you imagine the uh, concepts or disciplines like chemistry and uh, other physical sciences, uh, it could be uh, challenging for the new students to interact and uh, you know, uh, get injured. So therefore, uh, Ministry of Education, way back in 2009, we came up with the concept of virtual labs. And virtual labs uh, tries to address all these problems. Uh, and uh, the outreach program of these virtual labs began in 2014. So the idea is to ha allow uh, remote-based access of uh, virtual lab simulators. Uh, I think in your academics uh, setup also, you must have access to various types of si commercial simulators. Uh, so a similar uh, experience is to be given uh, with the help of virtual labs. And the idea behind this virtual lab is uh, to, Im to involve a very strong pedagogy, a very strong learning component uh, we try to associate with virtual labs so that it um, excites and enthusiasizes the students to, uh, uh, to experiment. With virtual labs, we try to provide a complete LMS uh, learning management system. I will try to uh, explain in the next, next few slides. So as every virtual lab is associated with uh, a theoretical concept, some quizzes, uh, and other uh, references to the theoretical concepts. So as of now, we have 1,000 plus experiments uh, uh, hosted on the, on the platform from nine disciplines of, these are core disciplines. These maps to AICT and UGC curriculum. So this is what uh, the Ministry of Education's uh, version of virtual labs uh, uh, has to it. Let me try to show you some, uh, some uh, snaps or screenshots uh, of the virtual labs. These are some very small, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, simula simulators. So, so, so the point that I'm trying to uh, uh, say here is that it is not needed that you need to come up with a very fancy uh, simulator uh, to involve uh, learning or to achieve a learning outcome. Remember I told you about mechanics, it's not a very fancy toy, but then there's a, uh, there has to be a very strong learning component inside that. Uh, and also we have some advan advanced versions of uh, virtual labs where you uh, can see there are more complex systems, there are more uh, uh, communication going on behind, behind the UI elements that you see. And this belongs to various uh, fields of uh, sciences and engineering. 
And the uh, important feature of virtual labs is that it allows you to self-test, uh, self-evaluate, and uh, uh, to test whether, uh, test your learning uh, from taking the virtual labs. So these are the consortium partners that we have in virtual labs, uh, IIT Bombay and several other IITs. We are 11 partnering institutes. IIT Bombay mainly looks at the uh, west region, uh, uh, states like Jammu Kashmir, uh, uh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, uh, Maharashtra, uh, and some parts of Goa and Karnataka. So all these uh, labs can be accessed through a common uh, portal, vlab.co.in, and uh, there are 1,000 plus simulators online for free of cost. Availability is 24 by 7. You can wake up even in middle of night just before the exam, and you can go there online and learn and repeat the practical sessions, like yours, uh, which takes the uh, responsibility of uh, rolling out the concept of virtual labs up to the students and faculties uh, who in uh, who in return uh, try to explain to their colleagues and then uh, through this method uh, we have uh, through this model of nodal centers we have conducted more than 9000 workshops this is this all data is coming from last uh, 6 years uh, and uh, as you can see there are 45 lakh usages means uh, one experiment taken one time uh, is one usage so at the national count of 45 lakhs, uh, IIT Bombay has contributed to almost half of the total usages so far. And uh, we have engaged with uh, more than 6 lakh students and uh, several faculties. So our outreach program has been uh, quite popular. And, uh, and uh, maritime institutes uh, like yours is, uh, is, I think, a first one uh, to uh, uh, get this concept. Uh, and uh, I think you will benefit at large from it. So this is our uh, rollout model. We have uh, nodal centers. And in the nodal center, we have nodal coordinator, uh, department coordinator, nodal technical coordinators. Uh, and above the nodal centers, once uh, a nodal center is outperforming nodal center uh, and who has helped us to uh, you know, sign up more nodal centers, we make them as a regional center. And uh, there are uh, you know, related roles to them. So this rollout model is something that we have created uh, uh, at IIT Bombay. This was not a mandate from Ministry of Education. Uh, some of it was, but most of it uh, we have uh, gone ahead and uh, we have listened to the problems of uh, uh, and the challenges of the colleges facing in rollout and therefore we came up with this model. And due to this model we have been contributing to almost half of the uh, rollout to the uh, national coverage. Now this is what uh, the Ministry of Education's uh, uh, project was. And uh, at IIT Bombay, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is, we are always uh, curious to know uh, the problems and challenges uh, faced at the academics. Therefore, we came up with a, uh, a community-based uh, approach. When we started listening to uh, you know, uh, some champion uh, nodal coordinators, nodal technical coordinators, and so on, and to the, some very uh, good students, we understood that we have to go beyond the ministry's mandate of virtual labs to create uh, nodal centers and have rollout. We, we could clearly see the curiosity uh, and the enthusiasm in the in the academic in the academic uh, uh, roles that we had uh, to go beyond virtual labs and try to do something more. Okay, so just so till now they were just uh, receiving the content, consuming the content of virtual labs, but there was a curiosity to build something more. So something was missing, and therefore uh, these faculties and students they came up to us and said uh, uh, we want to develop virtual labs. And uh, they started with uh, building some prototypes, and uh, uh, which uh, we really liked them. And we thought, okay, let us engage with them and create a separate community wing called as VLab Dev. So VLab Dev is um, is a very upcoming uh, community, uh, and probably it will be at a global level shortly. Uh, as of now, we are trying to engage with all the 100 plus colleges in the country towards content development. Uh, let me just give you an overview. The motivation behind this was uh, we have more than 700 universities in, in the country. And now, a government mandate can always run, a project can run for uh, uh, five year, 10 year, and so on, but it cannot run forever. The virtual labs addressed um, uh, a big gap in the, in a big gap in the uh, academic setup where virtual learning was missing. Uh, the practical lab component was missing, online component. So. Now the demand was even more uh, to fill the gap that is more than 50%. And this is what I'm talking about only the core curriculums. This is not covering discipline like yours. That is uh, largely untouched. So uh, if you see the overall gap, it will be more than 65-70% covering. The camps are, uh, is, a, is a training program and uh, 
a mentoring program where we, uh, you know, where we give trainings to the students and faculties and we help them to create content. Uh, more than 1,000 students and teachers have been trained and 250 experiment has been developed. But let me tell you, if you think the, these experiment developments, so each experiment is a software, is an application, just like you have an Android application in your cell phone. Uh, every, every virtual lab has several experiments in it. Uh, so seven to eight virtual lab, uh, virtual experiments form one virtual lab. And uh, 250 uh, software is, is a big challenge. And designing the pedagogy behind that, the learning component behind that, uh, this would have been impossible without the support of the community. Uh, from 2009 to 2014, 2014-16, uh, uh, we took almost you know seven to eight years to develop 1,000 experiments. But with the help of community, within three years, we could come up with uh, 250 plus experiments, and uh, which which has a very strong pedagogy behind that. And with the uh, with the community, we are continuously evolving our process. We are improving the quality of the content that we are creating. So in these boot camps, uh, we have retrospectives where after each event, uh, we come back, we uh, talk about uh, the achievements, what what was, what went wrong, what could be corrected, and and we keep on evolving after uh, each event. So eight national boot camps that you see, the very first, if you see the result, what you had in the first event of the first event and the last event, uh, you will see you will see a significant difference. And it has all come up uh, because of the help of the community and towards uh, continuous uh, improvement programs. Uh, and as of as a result of this, today nationally we have uh, achieved uh, expertise on pedagogy uh, and storyboarding, complex ideas, and simulator development. Right from uh, coding technologies, mobile-based technologies, uh, education technologies, we have been trying to uh, excel ourselves and uh, uh, be the pioneers in uh, the virtual labs globally. Some of our virtual labs have been received the best for the graduate students. Uh, from uh, like your 10 plus 2, uh, like from your uh, first year of the country uh, is the responsibility of IIT Bombay as of now. So, towards this, uh, when we started doing uh, this process, as uh, even the previous speaker mentioned, that uh, when you have a process in place and you continuously improve the process, you also identify the, ch the champions, the talents. Uh, the champions, in fact, she is, has received many best teacher awards. Uh, so we have been very fortunate that uh, uh, not just once, but there are several uh, talented people, uh, not just from faculty, but also from the student community who have been uh, propelling our program towards success. So this is a, these are just few examples of the contribution that uh, Mumbai, Gujarat, uh, and even in North part of India. So they, these 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 experiments are not developed by. IITs. These experiments are developed by the colleges like yours. This is one of the uh, lab that uh, the PBG College in Pune has developed, and you can see uh, the interface here. And it is hosted on the national uh, platform, the IIT Bombay platform, which is in fact uh, not just used in our country; it is also used at international level. Uh, we have had uh, cases uh, like uh, you know feedbacks from uh, from the Middle East, from US, from UK, uh, where in the pandemic. Uh, let me tell you, it was a boon for the academic community, uh, and uh, uh, therefore now uh, uh, everybody has realized that there is a, a big need to come up with uh, even better virtual labs and uh, fill the syllabus gap. And just few IITs, just 11 partnering institutes, uh, cannot cater to the entire nation. If it is a problem statement that belongs to our institute, to your classrooms, to your friends, and to you as an individual, you have to step ahead and take an initiative take this challenge and come up and try to solve this problem. Okay, and through this process, uh, we identify you, we can give you uh, different uh, uh, you know, uh, platforms to showcase your talent, uh, and you can uh, solve many other challenges uh, uh, around you. So as I mentioned about the development uh, sessions, the workshops, uh, we had uh, events in uh, several parts of the cities uh, in the country. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, sessions from Baroda. And uh, can you identify who is the faculty and the student here? It's very difficult, right? In fact, um, and uh, uh, because the vibe that is there in these events, uh, people just get uh, lost in the activities that they are doing. So literally, I mean, there's a faculty who is sitting and trying to help the students to solve a, a challenge. Um, and uh, you can see there are automatically we saw that there are micro teams, uh, there are self-assembling groups that come up and uh, uh, they try to solve challenges. 
there is interaction between uh, different uh, departments. So all these students that you can see, students and faculties, this group, there is no, not a single uh, uh, department here. There is a uh, conglomeration of uh, faculty and students from computer science. In fact, the person who is coding is from computer science. There are students from uh, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. So all are coming together to solve a challenge. And if you see in, in your practical uh, uh, situations, you in, in your practical situations uh, or the scenarios, you never find uh, one part of science or one discipline of science trying to come solve the problem. It's always a collective approach. Even uh, the, uh, the machineries and the equipments that you see in your disciplines, you have involvement of electronic engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and so on. So it has to be always a uh, collaborative approach. You cannot work in silos. You cannot see, say that you, it is you, just your discipline who, uh, uh, you know, based on whose knowledge that you can solve the problem. Problem solving approach involves creating a culture, creating a, a culture of collaboration, uh, trying to ask questions, trying to build processes, and, uh, and therefore trying to come up with uh, optimal solutions. So this is one of the very uh, successful event, and you can see the, uh, the participant group here. We cannot fit in the frame, right? So uh, uh, and these are uh, this from Gujarat University, and the vice chancellor and all the team from uh, the participants are all from all over the country. Uh, these were before the pandemic. And we also offer internships, and um, uh, we help form the student clubs from next week onwards. Uh, there's going to be a meeting with the nodal technical coordinators and also at your institute. We'll be forming student clubs who can uh, come and try to contribute uh, towards virtual lab development. Uh, we, try to, uh, we try to imbibe all those features uh, and all the skills in the students. Uh, so it is not just trying to design and develop a simulator or design and develop a virtual lab. Uh, there is a whole lot that goes behind this. You need, you need to learn how to work in teams. You need to work, know how to manage a particular task. How you, you need to uh, understand how to create processes and how to create a person independent processes uh, so that it can sustain. Y uh, the virtual lab that you are coding or you are contributing to, next batch of students should be able to take it ahead because you know that software is never complete. Software development keeps on happening. There is not even a single application in your cell phone that doesn't get an update every <coughs> few days or few weeks. So any software needs continuous uh, you know, uh, upgradation because the user wants the the end user wants some features. So similar to this, virtual lab is also a software, as I mentioned. So you have to design a process so that next batch of students uh, can come. So there has to be knowledge transfer. There has to be uh, uh, a process transfer. So we we try to create all these uh, you know uh, processes and uh, and these concepts through our student clubs. And most of the students who work with us. They get placed at very good institutes uh, globally. Uh, so this is just a team structure. We had this at the, uh, developing uh, the boot camps. Uh, so you can see there's a f team of faculty and students. They team up together and develop uh, the simulators. So initially, we started with three days, four days of activities. Then we it went to five-day activity. And one experiment could come up uh, from in five days. Later on, uh, in one of the events in uh, Kanpur we had uh, before the lockdown, uh, uh, it went for seven days, and uh, but uh, what happened uh, is that uh, you can see in red that uh, we had to extend the event uh, due to emergency. Uh, so the, at that time, I remember there was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ayodhya Mandir uh, uh, temple uh, uh, verdict from the Supreme Court, and uh, therefore there was a sudden uh, uh, closure or there was, a, uh, you know, uh, restrictions. We could not... Uh, and this, this was a very large event, a national event. So many people come from all parts of the country. And we were sitting back at our hotels and uh, students at their hostels and trying to say, uh, assess that what should we do to, uh, we, we cannot uh, stop a uh, thing. And of course, we had a process that was a good thing. It, it is just that we had to now go online and start the process. So in an online, in fact, this was one of the first hybrid mode of conducting an event uh, before the lockdown. Uh, and this helped us actually to come up, the moment lockdown was announced, uh, just, I think, 10 days later, we came up with an online event. Uh, we call it as Bootathon. It is Bootcamp and Hackathon, uh, where uh, more than 25 experiments uh, could develop. So you can see that we took an opportunity from the problems that we faced in the previous events, and that uh, 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 you know, resulted into uh, some big achievements uh, in, the, in the lockdown. So uh, this is how the registration and the content uh, you know, uh, uh, drill down, where you have we cover trainings on pedagogy, HTML, CSS, some software uh, components are there. Now we have introdu introduced design thinking also, and we are also introducing uh, project management, uh, agile project management, 
uh, 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 Kaban boards and uh, uh, different aspects of uh, project management. Uh, so this is a re this is a step that is involved towards creating a virtual lab, uh, finding syllabus uh, gap, uh, lab development proposal, review storyboards, and so on. So it is similar to how you make a movie. You don't just come up with a script and start making a movie. You have to design your storyboards. Let us say uh, the different scenes. You have to sketch it out before the de the actual shooting happens because that takes a lot of effort. Software development is a lot of effort. So a lot of thinking has to go um, uh, on boards before that. Uh, and what you, you will appreciate here is that uh, the review, number of reviews that you can see, and this is an iterative process. It's not that once the review is done at step 10 or step uh, 8, it is complete. We uh, go back and do this several times, maybe 5 times, 6 times, 10 times, so that we come up with the quality. So as, as I mentioned, Virtual Lab is a national uh, program, and the contents that you see is nationally hosted. So the quality is very important. We, our focus is on quality. Maybe you just develop one or two simulators, but if that is lacking in terms of quality, then it is not um, acceptable. So how do you achieve quality? You continuously review this. And just imagine if you are developing virtual labs at your student clubs, and you go through these processes, you will actually practically learn how to uh, come up with quality, uh, you know, product or quality uh, processes. And uh, the, the, uh, the carrot or the benefits uh, behind uh, uh, being part of this community is that all your content uh, gets recognized. It is nationally hosted, and it is used by uh, several um, in the country. So uh, the roadmap that we have uh, for the future is to identify more regional centers. Uh, uh, I remember going to PBG College, uh, who, uh, Madam, who is from the PB, PG, PBG College back in 2015. Uh, they were just a nodal center like yours. And today, they are mentoring more than 60 nodal centers in the uh, Pune, Kolhapur, and Satara region. And we have some other uh, regional centers also in the country. But now, uh, with 300 plus nodal centers that we have, the burden has increased. And we are trying to identify uh, more champion institutes who can take up this challenge and uh, uh, first consume uh, the virtual labs, which is already there, 1,000 plus experiment, and then uh, contribute towards content, uh, uh, content development. And uh, more universities are started to include in the curriculum. You can give it a thought. If you think that syllabus coverage is uh, uh, good enough, uh, then try to include in your curriculum. Uh, many universities have started doing this because uh, now virtual lab, in fact, in the AICT model curriculum, it is a mandate. Uh, in the model curriculum, you can see there are several virtual labs listed in the uh, curriculum. Uh, we, uh, uh, we plan to conduct more boot camps, uh, and a lot of these boot camps that we conducted, uh, the funding was uh, locally, uh, some from participants, some from the institute. So we are trying to develop a sustainable model. As I mentioned, it is a community. A community should have its own way of sustainability, in both in terms of functioning, in terms of finances, in terms of uh, you know, coming with a quality product. So, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it is one of the very successful program. Uh, several big software companies like GitLab, uh, GitHub, and all, they have appreciated, uh, they have published case studies uh, on the way we work uh, and how we have adopted the uh, modern uh, project management culture. Uh, and the benefit out of the, uh, which you get is, of course, you get certified. And there are several boot camp, uh, pre boot camp sessions, but there's a lot of extensive pr training programs in technologies and uh, pedagogy. Uh, and of course, the expert review part. So uh, with VLAB Dev, uh, the, uh, we are opening, from next week, we are opening to all the nodal centers in our country. Till now, it is, we were working in a very uh, you know, controlled fashion, small experimentation. Now, when, once we have realized that our model is successful, of you know, four to five years of experimentation. Now we are trying to scale it up because once you achieve a, uh, a good model, you can then, uh, then only you can scale it up. So next week we are planning to scale it up uh, and see how it goes. And then uh, uh, we'll try to uh, span it to more parts of the country. Right now it will be only for the Western, Western region of the country. Uh, focus is on browser-based browser uh, mobile, uh, uh, you know, first approach. So whatever virtual labs that we plan to develop. In the pandemic, before pandemic we saw that uh, most of the content were taken on desktops. Uh, the percentage was 60%, 65% on desktop, but the analytics says us that the data that shows right now after pandemic is that uh, during and after pandemic, uh, only 15% of the content is taken on desktop and remaining 85% is taken on cell phones. So suddenly there is a sudden shift in the usage trend and uh, it takes a lot of time to, uh, these are 1,000 experiments, means 1,000 softwares. And to now re-engineer and redevelop these softwares uh, if to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, towards a mobile-first approach, 
it is a big challenge. And if there are enthusiasts in your community, the, your most uh, uh, better learning experience. Uh, we want to uh, come up with progressive uh, virtual labs where it assesses the performance of students and based on that it uh, throws challenges in front of the students. We have, we, there are some groups in the VLabs dev community who have started to create AI-based virtual labs, machine learning-based models on better uh, training uh, through virtual uh, labs and self-learning. Uh, remember I told you about the ideal lab that we imagine at IIT Bombay. Some of the student, some of the research groups in universities such as MS University, Baroda and elsewhere have started to do this. They have come up with uh, chemical engineering setups, uh, some components uh, outsourced from the local uh, you know, market, some very basic components. You don't have to create very fancy things. Within 5,000, 10,000, can you build an experimental rig for your, uh, for your lab setup? And uh, so such, such things have been started to happen. And integrate and make this DIY, uh, DIY uh, lab rigs very smart. You, Im you incorporate sensors in them and collect data and then see how, how the experimentation uh, takes place. So this is the next generation of virtual labs that we are uh, progressing and marching towards. And it is not the end uh, uh, of it uh, through hardware labs. Given that you have uh, taken a virtual lab and you have, uh, you know, your learning experience is enhanced, you have better uh, hold on your concepts, now you are a perfect candidate to solve other problems in the society, uh, right from, you know, problems with healthcare, um, uh, education, uh, maybe in filter talent, we can uh, give ch further challenges and try to solve several problems that we have around us. So with VLabs Dev, IIT Bombay, we have gone beyond just learning with online simulators. We are trying to create a, a sustainable ecosystem of healthy uh, environment in teaching, learning. Uh, and to summarize, so first thing that you need to do is that consume the content, the rollout, has to be very well uh, uh, done. Uh, all the faculties, all the department coordinators, all the uh, you know nodal coordinators have to uh, identify, map with the syllabus, uh, the semester, and try to take the con content. Once you uh, take the content, you will realize that th there are gaps, and there will be ideas that will uh, uh, come, you, that will strike you, and you have you can come up with them. Join the community, start developing content, and when you develop very good content. We will help you, handhold you to develop hardware-based next generation of virtual labs, uh, hardware-based labs. As, uh, as, as it was said uh, in the beginning of the session, that virtual lab is good, but it is not everything. There, nothing can beat the experience of uh, real-time uh, experience, you know, interacting with the hardware. So that is where we are going, trying to go with. And then together, uh, you and I uh, at IIT Bombay, our team, uh, we can help to solve other problems in the society through this uh, teaching learning process. Uh, that's it from my end. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, such an informative talk on VLabs. Uh, friends, we know that uh, we are running behind the schedule, but uh, please bear with us. Now to know more about uh, VLabs, we have our second speaker of the session, Professor Tanuja Khataukar. Ma'am is currently a faculty at Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering Department at PVG's College of Engineering and Technology, Pune. She has more than 30 years of teaching experience. In her career, she has published more than 13 research papers in international and national journals and conferences. She has recently been awarded the prestigious Adarsha Shikshak Puraskar for her exemplary work in education by the International Association of Lions Club. She was also awarded the platinum certification from IIT Bombay, IIT Kanpur, REC Banda Uttar Pradesh for the development of virtual labs at the national level Bhutathan in 2019. She was awarded for the developing a virtual lab and enhancing the teaching and learning process. Professor Katavkar is a Cambridge University certified international teacher trainer. She was nominated as the first regional coordinator in the country by Virtual Labs IIT Bombay. She is a certified reviewer and mentor for virtual lab development by V Labs IIT Bombay. Now, without further delay, I'd like to invite Professor Katavkar to make her presentation.
you so much for that introduction. And uh, I thank my previous speaker, Mr. Pushpadip Mishra, for making the task so easy for me. Sir has covered almost all the points that are essential as far as virtual labs are concerned. Before I start my talk, a very good afternoon to all of you, all the authorities, dignitaries of Tolani Maritime Institute. I take this opportunity first to thank Dr. Sanjeev, principal, then the vice principal, Captain Hirkani, sir. I also thank the convener of Transtech 2022, Anirudh Kumar, sir, and his team for inviting us to discuss with you about virtual labs. I saw the keen interest from Tolani group when uh, Dr. Madiwale sir, Shrikant sir, Dr. Shrikant Madiwale sir, he approached us that Tulani Institute would like to become a part of virtual labs. I will be taking a few minutes, you'll find a few slides which would be overlapping with uh, the previous slides because we work together, okay? And before I start the talk, I would like to mention that Pune Vidyarthi Grihas College of Engineering and Technology and GK Patiwani Institute of Management it is run by a parent institute called as Pune Vidyarthi Graha. Earlier it was called as Anath Vidyarthi Graha. I take this opportunity to talk about my institute for a minute because I belong to this institute for last 28 plus years. So Pune Vidyarthi Graha, that is Anath Vidyarthi Graha, earlier it was called as Anath Vidyarthi Graha. It is, uh, it is an institute which is serving the society for in education for last 113 years. And uh, I respect and hence I feel the need of sharing this with you. It's a system, it's an ecosystem which has helped us to work together with other teams from regions, not only from Maharashtra, but all over India. And I would be talking from the perspective of the students basically. Already, sir has given you the information regarding these two national platforms, that is virtual labs, that is the Ministry of Education, that's one portfolio that we talked about, and the second is We Labs Day, which is the community effort. So my objective today is just to motivate you people, the students and the faculty out here, you know, to make use of, or you can say, utilize these virtual labs as a supplement to the physical labs. Nowhere we are saying that we're going to you know, replace, no. We are just going to use them as a supplement to the physical labs to get a better understanding and to create content mapping you know, to your curriculum. Your curriculum, you have subjects which are slightly different than what the normal engineering courses have. So you have a very broad scope wherein you can uh, develop, you can be a part of it. So I'll be just touching upon these points which are shown out there one by one. And uh, before, again, I take this journey of uh, success story of PVG COET as a regional center, I would first like to congratulate on behalf of the regional center to all the authorities, all the faculties, all the heads, the students, that now you are a nodal center for virtual labs, the first nodal center in all the maritime engineering colleges. I think this needs a big round of applause. <laughs> Yes. We are going to talk about technology. Yes, Transtech 2022 is based on the upcoming technologies. Virtual Labs, yes, it is a technology which served as a boon, you know, it's a, it was a blessing, especially during the COVID lockdown period, wherein absolutely nobody had any choice of the physical laboratories. And the entire world switched, you know, the, there was a paradigm shift in the way we taught and we learned. So virtual labs really came out as a blessing, especially during COVID-19. And this was the period where PVG COET and the other regional centers, along with IIT Bombay virtual labs team, we could help the students to make fruitful utilization of their time. They had ample time, they were at home, right? So we could make the maximum usage or we could utilize the time effectively. As Sir mentioned, it's a tool, it's a technology or a tool which is available to you 24 by seven, free of cost. You can learn at your own pace, at your own place. 
and multiple number of times you can work on it and try to get the uh, essence of that particular practical. This also can be used as a teaching assistant for all the faculties out here. You can use it as a teaching assistant to explain difficult concepts maybe instead of you know, writing the certain things on the board or demonstrating them through a video, you could take up some virtual labs to the classroom as well and help the students to understand these concepts. And uh, this is the, just a structure which will help the faculty, the coordinators, especially Dr. Suj uh, Professor Sujata Ma'am and the nodal technical coordinator, Mr. Ashraf, if I'm not wrong, right? They would be uh, able to visualize how the structure is. As Sir rightly mentioned, Pushpadeep Sir rightly mentioned, uh, virtual labs, Ministry of Education, it's a government of uh, India in his, uh, initiative. And these are the 11 consortium uh, uh, in the institutes, we can say, of which IIT Bombay is one of them, and PVG COET is one of the regional centers which works with IIT Bombay. There are other regional centers as well. You need to know first the structure, because you students, when you're going to work with us, right, you need to know where am I going to march, you know, which are those people with whom I'm going to interact in future. How do I take this you know, virtual labs to a larger, higher extent, you can say, with good quality labs from your side? in your uh, faculty who have been working for the community model. So the faculty from Tulani Institute, if they come forward along with their students to develop virtual labs or to fill up the syllabus gaps, in that case, yes, you can be a part of this team, okay? You're always welcome. These are all the regional coordinators, the technical coordinators, and uh, you can say the torch bearers for the community model. And following the, you know, taking at that structure, now PVJ COET, as Sir mentioned, we have more than 60 nodal centers with us, of which Tolani Institute is one of the, now it's one of the nodal centers, but the first kind in maritime and nautical science engineering, we can say. Every nodal center has to not only exercise internal workshops for the students and faculty, but also they are supposed to take a responsibility to take this virtual lab project you know, to the community, to the grassroots level. So you have to, uh, you need to take up some outreach workshops for faculty from the nearby region, let's say, to the colleges, to the faculties from nearby regions, we can say. And uh, this is the mapping of the different nodal centers under PVG's College of Engineering and Technology, which is called as RCID1, the regional center one. And these are the institutes. You'll find if you look at the spectrum of these institutes, they're not only institutes from Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University, but also they are deemed universities, deemed to be universities, they're autonomous uh, institutes. So you'll find that the syllabus structure of each one of them is different. And we're trying to fill up the syllabus gaps by taking help of all these students and the faculties from the community. So these are the different um, institutes that we have with us. Uh, so we mentor nearly around 57 plus uh, engineering colleges, we can say. And uh, look at this graph. I specifically wanted to show it to you people. This is a usage of only Pune region. You know, that's PVG COET. Uh, under that, you'll find there's a drastic change in the way the uh, virtual labs have been utilized. So nearly three lakh, uh, you know, three lakh utilization we had in 2021, and two lakh utilization, that is number of experiments that are performed. Usage is number of experiments, as Sir mentioned in his talk. So, just in two years' time, can you see that, please? I know it's high time. It's lunch uh, time as well. But I would like to take this opportunity to talk to you once, because you, I am looking forward to all the faculty and students in this uh, group to come ahead. And even those people who are attending the uh, session online, I would like to appeal all those faculty and students as well. Look at the usage. Now there is a change in the way we learn, right? So in last two years, we nearly have, I think, uh, around five lakh, that's five lakh experiments performed by two lakh uh, students just in, in a span of two years. So yes, I would also like to share the success story of PVG COET. Why do I share this story, you know, all the time talking about the success story at different institutes, is to motivate the faculty and students, to encourage them, to show them the brighter side of what we develop and contribute to the community, okay? So we have a very strong coordination with the uh, Virtual Labs IIT Bombay team uh, since 2015. That's when we joined the team. And uh, we have 
we had a massive rollout from our side. And that, why am I stating this is, you need to understand, when you go for utilization of these labs day in and day out, you realize what should be the nature of the virtual lab. You know, what, are the best part, what is the best part of it? And what are the lacunas that are there? Is there a way to improvise those virtual labs? You know, uh, whether you can plan some good learning outcomes from these virtual labs. This you can figure out only when you utilize the existing ones. Starting off you know, on your own, something new, without looking at what, what exists, may not be brought to the level which we, which, could be, uh, which we can reach with the potential of the students. So massive rollout is at, of utmost importance before we go for the development of virtual labs. And uh, networking is one more advantage that you get when you work as a team. You know, as I mentioned, more than 57 nodal centers. When I say nodal centers, we have all the faculties in each of those centers you know, interacting with us in some or the other way. So this improvises, improves the networking that we have. Above all, the beauty of this is uh, at PVG COET, we have a students club. And that's the Virtual Labs Digitizers Forum. These are some, certain, some of the accolades that we have at our end when I say it's a success story. It's, I'm representing on behalf of my team, all the faculty and the students who have exerted to reach these goals. So we were the first private unaided institute in the country to develop virtual labs under the mentorship of IIT Bombay team. And we were the first regional uh, centers as well. And as Sir mentioned, Pushpadeep Sir mentioned, we're the pioneers of VLabs Dev. We demonstrated you know, sample cases, two cases in 2015. And uh, those two cases are still being reviewed and they are yet, and they are also on the, you know, in the pipeline to the Ministry of Education, you can say, uh, portal to be published. But yes, they are published on the VLabs Dev platform. So we get a national, the students and the faculty for the contribution that they do, they get a national recognition on both these uh, uh, websites, that is MOE, VLabs, as well as the VLabs Dev, we can say. These are some of the labs that are uh, created by the faculty from Pune Vidyarthi Grahas College of Engineering and Technology. So you'll find nearly around 13 uh, labs. So 118 experiments, 118 experiments we could create. So Sir mentioned about uh, 250 experiments. So around 50% of them have been created by PVG's College of Engineering and Technology. Yes. Thank you. And uh, next time when I come to Tolani Institute, I would also like to see such progress from the students and faculty from Tolani Institute, especially in the domain of virtual labs. I would be really happy. Undoubtedly, I'm happy to be with you people, a disciplined uh, you know, environment out here. And that gives us more motivation to work towards good quality labs. We look forward to your contribution as well. We were awarded the best shining nodal centers by Abhasi MHRD uh, V Lab during 18 and both the years, 18 and 19. And uh, yes, we backed the platinum certification as it was rightly mentioned. I said students club is the beauty of this project. Yes, these students, they not only take training, they train the other students, okay? And they also work as resource persons to other colleges to during the boot camps, bootathons. So look at the level that we are uh, you know, taking our students, not only from the classroom teaching learning, we're taking them to an environment wherein globally they'll be talking to faculty, they'll be discussing with students of other disciplines, of other institutes, you know, outrightly a very different environment they may be having, but you work together, as Sir rightly showed a few pictures earlier. So these students, they work as mentors at different national events. This is the, this is the students club that we have at PVG COET, you'll find the management, uh, which is very supportive. I said about an ecosystem at PVG COET, the management is very supportive and helps us to take ahead every step uh, that leads us to you know, coming up with quality labs. So you'll find students in this. Why am I showing you this picture? I, need, I love to talk about my students. That's the thing. You'll find students in this image who have already graduated. They're taking either the master's course or they're working at IIT Bombay on different projects. Some of them are still under you know, taking their curriculum, that is third year and final year courses. But some of them have also Though they are alumni of the institute, still they contribute to the virtual labs by being resource persons, by mentoring the new generation. 
So this legacy has to continue. Why did I speak about Pune Vidyarthi Guru having a legacy of 113 years? The reason is this has to be in our blood. No? We need to take it ahead. So these students, they keep on mentoring the new batches and help them to understand how to develop virtual labs, and not only that, but work on different projects, how to take up internships that are offered by IIT Bombay, how to upskill themselves by taking some spoken tutorials, some free open source software tools, you know, learning new technologies, so that you are aligned with the job descriptions or you're aligned with the uh, job, des uh, job description for the internship as well, right? So that's why it's important that I talk about my students. So in this forum, Typically, we have an audit course on virtual lab development. Again, this forum is run by the students, senior students, PhD, junior students. So you'll find there's no faculty in between out here. Only the faculty initially creates a structure, you know, what are the different contents to be delivered to the students, and the structure is upgraded by the faculty. But it's being delivered by each of the members in the team. Yes, all these, one of these the contributions that are done by the students based on the amount of contribution that they have done, they are certified by IIT Bombay Virtual Labs team. Okay, that's a feather in the cap. You know, that makes the resume very strong, I must say. So they are certified. Undoubtedly, the coding skills, the interpersonal skills, management skills, time management, all these things, they learn through such projects, collaborative projects, which are multidisciplinary in nature. And uh, yes, we started our journey with one small um, step, which was the first workshop for virtual lab development at PVG's College of Engineering and Technology. And uh, we could help the community to come up with virtual labs. And we were then given the opportunity to serve as a, as a regional center. Yes? So I'm again showing certain slides. I want you to see the different um, essential components which are running behind this effort called as virtual labs. You'll find students helping other students, students helping teachers. Right? And you'll find the team behind it. You'll also find Dr. Pushpadi from IIT Bombay also working with the teams, local teams. Right? So teamwork always works. That's what I always believe. And uh, this is what we have been experiencing. And I expect the same from Tolani Institute, that we work together as a team and take ahead this virtual labs project. And these are some of the uh, events that we have been a part of. Okay, All those bootathons, boot camps, which were done at different places, uh, Pan India. And these are my students from PVG COET who worked as developers, who worked as uh, coders, managers, right? And they have got different multiple opportunities, not only, not only to develop virtual labs, help the faculty to code and translate the ped strong pedagogies and uh, storyboards that are written by the faculty into interactive simulators but also, but also work on some projects which they get from IIT Bombay and also work on internships that are offered by IIT Bombay, okay? So this is, you know, this is an unending list. So you'll find all these students, they have come ahead, not only the third year, final year students or second year students, even the first year students, even the first year students conducted a two days national program on web development. And we had nearly 3,541 students who participated, not only participated, but submitted the projects and they were evaluated. And this entire thing was done by the student community. So we believe in the potential the students have. The only thing is you just have to plan and you just have to march on the path. So content creation, as Sir mentioned, massive rollout is required so that you get the essence of the virtual labs. And yes, there exists a huge gap in syllabus which has to be filled by the community itself. And uh, before I end my talk, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to this uh, virtual labs. I just have been uh, you know, representing all the efforts that are taken by different faculty and students, not only from Pune with Dharti Graha, Graha's College of Engineering and Technology, but also other regions as well. Yeah, and thanks for that patient listening. I do understand it's high time. Thank you so much.
behalf of everyone at TMI, I'd like to express our gratitude for your precious time, ma'am. Your presence has indeed been very valuable to us today, and we are certainly looking forward to another interaction in the future. I request our senior vice principal, Captain Manoj Hirkane, to kindly felicitate our guest speakers, Professor. Uh, I would like to first start by thanking the organizing committee for two reasons. One is of course is official, standard, the other on a very, very personal basis. I always find it very strange that there's somebody on the stage saying thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. And the audience reaction is, is getting late. I want, I'm feeling hungry, get me out of here. So when I saw that slot, I said, wow, you have another session after this. <laughs> Nobody is going nowhere, so I can take my own sweet time and not be the villain. So thank you very much, organizers, for giving me this one. Well, on a more serious note, uh, yes, a lot of hard work has gone in. A lot of man hours were spent. Will it be online? Now offline, again online, then hybrid. Thanks to the various government uh, diktats and lockdown uh, measures, there's a lot of changes into this. And uh, once we finally came to this thing that yes, it's going to be hybrid, a lot of hard work was required to put the plan into action. A Herculean effort, ably supported by Shabana Ma'am and her admin assistants, Ved Prakash and his eager beavers, Hiren and his henchmen, Deep Chand and his daredevils, Pavan, Prasad, Swami, Mukesh, Davesar, Swati Ma'am, Nilima Ma'am, all on their toes. I'm sure all of you must have lost a couple of kilos at least. Charge it to Anirudh. But uh, thank you very much for all the hard work done. They say that hard work beats talent when talent does not work hard. But when talent starts to work hard, it's going to be awesome. And that is what exactly the student community of TMI has done, led by the ICC right in the front, supported by Tsunami, Harshit, and many more. And despite the fact that I kept troubling you every day, you've done an awesome job. That is, of course, despite me. So very, very well done. Thank you very much. And in the center of the web, peacefully, with a monk-like expression, full of concentration, spinning away, you know, making those spider nets of his, was the spider, Anirudh Kumar. Every time a hole was punched into his uh, theory, he would start stitching up again something over there. I think he made something like nine different schedules in the last five days. I only know that I'm the correct slot because Tsunami called me. I still don't know what is the correct slot that is happening over there. Truly, it would not have been possible to hold an event of such scale and magnitude without the sincere and untiring efforts of my colleagues and student volunteers in the organizing team. I thank each and every one of them. Yesterday afternoon, we had two technical sessions. I wish to thank all the paper presenters for the wonderful job done in showcasing their ideas and thoughts, both offline and online. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Dr. Sudhir Sindhavi and Dr. Nitin Janarkar for chairing those sessions. A big thank you to the gentleman assigned the most difficult job, 
Mr. Anil Bhatt, Mr. Arvind Kumar, I think he's on virtual mode, and my good friend, Captain Govind Rajan, for their efforts towards judging the papers. And they still have a long way to go. They want more papers and models and posters and whatnot. You, So, JK, how do you like this belated birthday gift that Anirudh has given you? <laughs> Coming to the present. Today, Mr. Prahul Kalankar, Professor uh, Tanuja Khatavkar, and Professor Mishra share with us their knowledge and experiences. Ma'am, sir, you have guided us in the right direction. We really appreciate that. And also the fact that you have taken out time from a very, very busy, important schedule to guide our young students and enthusiastic faculty. Thank you for the invaluable contribution. In your lecture on introduction to virtual labs, you beautifully brought out how to provide remote access to simulation-based labs in various disciplines of science and engineering. And today, in the age of e-learning post-COVID, Virtual labs are the game changer, as you mentioned, in removing both the physical distances and the lack of resources. Sir, ma'am, I really envy my faculty from the mechanical and the electrical levels. You have made life so much easy for them. I, as a seafarer who is supposed to be an expert in rope work, when I try to teach my students on how to practice their knots, bends, and hitches that we really enjoy over Zoom, all I ended up was tying myself up in knots. <laughs> so I hope that should get away very soon. And uh, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. And of course, thank you for making TMI the first Maritime Institute to be a part of your elite club. I express my deep sense of appreciation to Professor Kalankar for his explanation and demonstration of total quality management with such simplicity. They say a mediocre teacher tells, a good teacher explains, a superior teacher demonstrates, a great teacher inspires. Your application of TQM in your industry is truly inspiring. And from all the good words that I've heard from the principal and from Srikanth about you, I can say without fear or favor that you are a role model to all of us. And very soon, you and I will be interacting a bit more along with Razi and some of my other colleagues over here. And we really look forward to that. Dear cadets, both who are here physically and those who are somewhere virtually, if you are there, that is. <laughs> Today you witnessed two masterpieces of technical talk. And rather than assimilating them in two, as two separate lectures, I would seriously recommend that you comprehend them together. And then you will realize two very, very important things. One. Why Aristotle said that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? And two, how well the two lectures kind of dovetailed to the flush fit with our motto of ask. On one hand, you have the knowledge and a new skill of virtual labs. On the other hand, if you put down into practice from theory, as Professor Kalankar said, and he has first talked about uh, organization, but look at it personally. How can you imbibe those features that he talked, the 12 principles that he talked about on a personal basis? Can you make continual development? Yes. Can you improve your communication? Yes. The last thing he said, what does your employer want? Customer satisfaction? Can you do that to yourself? Yes. Can you adapt to change? Yes. So try and get those, at least whatever, or most of those 12 principles in you to improve. And what is that word we are looking for? What improves when you do that to yourself? Your attitude, right? Before I go any further, let's wake them up. How many of you have seen that popular Hindi film, Three Idiots? Very nice. Nice film. Yes, All of you have seen it? Yes, sir. What was the last dialogue that was there in the movie just before the closing credits? And the song went, you know, jab life ho out of control, ho do ko karke bol. Uske pehlo dialogue kya? Tumne bola tumne dekha. What is the dialogue? No? Baba Ramchorda sahi kehte the. Bacha kabil bano kabil. Kamiyabi to sali chak marke pichya. Right or wrong? Yes. 
Which is the operational word over here? Kabu. In your industry, how do you show Kabiliya? Which is the word? Your certificates of competency. Competent. Who do you call competent? Who is competent? Somebody who has attitude, skill, and knowledge in equal measure. Attitude, skill, knowledge delivered to you in equal measure too. So, Professor Vishwa, Professor Khadavkar, Professor Khalankar, on behalf of TMI, for giving us a wonderful experience even better than three idiots. <laughs> For your time, your effort, your thought processes, on behalf of Karani Maritime Institute, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, enjoy the rest of the evening. Stay well, stay safe, and of course, go ahead. the third technical session of Transact 2022. The judges remain the same. That is, we have Mr. Anil Bhatt, Mr. Arvind Kumar, and Captain Govind Rajan Krishnaswamy as our judges. We will be presenting one technical paper now. I request everyone to please rise for the dignitaries to leave. I request everyone to kindly be seated. We will be presenting one technical paper now, and the other three technical papers will be presented post-lunch. The session chair for this session is Dr. Sagar Mane Deshmukh. Dr. Sagar Mane Deshmukh is a PhD holder from Satyabama University who has more than 15 years of experience in teaching and other industries. He has authored 17 research papers, six conference papers, and has one patent on his name. Dr. Manit Deshmukh has worked with many cutting edge companies such as Kirloskar Brothers Limited, JSPM Group, Sihagar Group, etc. Now I request Dr. Manit Deshmukh to kindly come up on stage to chair the, the third technical session of TransTech 2022.
हेलो हेलो ओके गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑफ यू बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द सेशन आई वुड लाइक टू मेंशन सिंसियर थैंक्स टुवर्ड्स टीएमआई मैनेजमेंट प्रिंसिपल सर संजीत कानंगू सर सीनियर वाइस प्रिंसिपल मनोज हिरकने सर वी पी एम ई शैलेन्द्र कुमार सर वी पी एम एस यू पी एन एस बैनर्जी सर टेक्नोलॉजी इज ऑलवेज बेस्ड वेन इट ब्रिंग्स पीपल टुगेदर एंड दी टेक्निकल सेशन्स आर ऑलवेज प्लैटफॉर्म्स वेर लर्निंग पीपल एंड गाइडिंग पीपल कम्स टुगेदर so let us start with today's technical presentation and the first with the permission of judges i would like to start the session so the first paper in today's session is black carbon as a form of greenhouse gas and uh, this will be presented by karan manpreet and manav so i so uh, mainly it is related to timing in the rules i'll have to present the paper for 10 uh, minutes uh, and the question answer session will be there for 3 minutes right thank you so 12 minutes sorry 12 minutes uh, presentation will be there and 3 uh, minutes for question and answer session so you can start with your presentation you're ready for the presentation all of you okay okay so good afternoon respected jury uh, session chair and everyone present here so today we are going to speak on the topic black carbon so i cadet karan rotela with my colleagues manav gujjar and uh, manpreet singh of me first year are going to talk on the topic black carbon as a form of greenhouse gas so our topic is a part of a major topic which is imo gg strategy IMO GHG strategies actually envisages on reducing the carbon footprint of the marine sector uh, per transport network that is by an average of about 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050 so in our presentation we will be mainly talking about black carbon which is one of the major effluents released from any sector be it the maritime sector transportation sector or the industrial sector the other uh, uh, effluents are nox sox and n2 so the question comes what is actually black carbon black carbon is a form of a pyrocrystalline carbon pyrocrystalline substances are the substances which have small to medium range of order in their regular lattice black carbon is actually formed by the process of incomplete combustion this incomplete combustion takes place because of mainly three reasons the first is improper mixing of fuel and uh, air insufficient amount of temperature and the insufficient amount of uh, air present in the combustion process climate forcing reagent the black carbon also has a very important impact of climate forcing reagent the climate forcing reagent is because it actually depends on two things like first the amount of black carbon found in the atmosphere and the location of black carbon present in the atmosphere like if this black carbon is present in the layer where clouds are formed it actually increases the rate of evaporation and if this black carbon is near the surface it actually absorbs the uh, sun rays and has a warming impact and lastly if this black carbon is found in the layer below the stratocumulus clouds it actually acts as a layer of blocking uh, blocking the sun rays thereby giving a cooling impact on the nature lastly uh, black carbon reflects less to no light uh, in the visible spectrum this thing has major two impacts on black carbon and its characteristics first of all the uh, color black of black carbon is because of this and secondly the ability of black carbon to absorb 
and give a warming impact to the nature is because of this. Soot. See, this black substance, which most of the first years and we have not practically seen in our life, as we have not been to the Prabhu Vidya, because we were busy doing uh, fitting in the workshop. But that story is for some another day. But uh, like, but our, uh, I'm pretty sure that our respected jury, seniors, and many faculties who have sailed before or who have done their internship in reputed companies must have seen this black substance near the uh, exhaust mechanisms of the ship. So this black substance is nothing but soot. Soot is a form of black carbon which we can see through our naked eyes. Uh, it is a, a form of black carbon which is formed when it mixes with other effluents and it is obtained after the process of combustion. So the question comes, why to study on black carbon? Why did we make a presentation on black carbon? The first thing is that the modernizing industrial sector is the major producer of this black carbon. This black carbon is the exoskeleton of every fuel used in any industry, take in maritime industry or the transport or any industry or any fuel which is used like gasoline, distillate fuel, HFOs and everywhere. You will find black carbon as the core. Secondly, the life-threatening stance. Because the I can prove this point by giving a study carried out by WHO according to which um, the disease is due to preventable. I repeat, preventable uh, uh, environmental risk has led to about 3.7 million deaths due to just household air pollution and 4.7 million deaths due to uh, outdoor air pollution. Difficult to keep record. See, the main reason behind this is due to the absence of proper measuring devices. Like if we want to measure the amount of dust particles in the air, we have devices like AQI meters and all. But for black carbon, we lack these uh, good technologies because of which it leads to faulty studies in the future. And lastly, it, it forms complex structure. As I was telling you about the climate forcing ability of black carbon, I told you that if it's near the surface, it, it absorbs the sun rays. And when it is near the stratocumulus cloud, it actually blocks. So did a question come in your mind that why the uh, characteristic of black carbon is suddenly changing? The reason behind this is because this black carbon actually combines with other uh, particulate matter like sulfates and nitrates and form complex compounds. And these complex compounds can uh, alter the actual chemical ca characteristics of black carbon. So with this, I will like to pass it over to Manpreet, who will tell you about the impacts of black carbon. So as we all know that whenever there is energy, there is the impact on nature as well as on the human beings. So first, climbing the sun. So one unit of black carbon contains about warming impact of 460 to 1500 uh, higher than the CO2. The black carbon have less life expectancy than any other polybin. The black carbon remains in the air for more than a week and the impact which causes by the black carbon is much more than any other polybins on the climate. S for example, like glaciers in Antarctica. Health impacts. So the size of black carbon is PM 2.5, where PM stands for particulate matter. The PM 2.5 size is so small that it cannot be seen through our naked eyes. So whenever we breathe or inhale, there is a uh, the PM 2.5 particles. It travels to our respiratory system into the lungs, where alveoli uh, mix the O2 and the black carbon, causing inferior taste and diseases like lung cancer, etc. The children's and the aged people are the more vulnerable uh, to the respiratory disorder because they have less immune system and less resistance to the black carbon. So as my friend already told you about the facts and figures of death count, it's about 7 million each year due to the black carbon. Arctic issue. As we all know, the there are many oil rigs and the shipping routes in North, North Sea uh, due to which they emit black carbon through the air. Uh, uh, whenever the black carbon starts settling down on the ice in the Arctic, they start absorbing the photons from the sunlight. And that photons and that heat starts evaporating due to which there is a warming impact around the surrounding, causing them, causing the rate of melting increase and drastically increasing the water level. But uh, the ice has lost its albedo. So what is albedo? Albedo is the rate of reflection of light from the surface of ice. So Arctic is the most and major, which is uh, more drastically melting than any other ice present in the world. So now I would like to handle it to Manav. Uh, now I will tell you all about the control measures which you need to take uh, 
uh, to control the emission of black carbon, soot particles, NOx, and SOx. Uh, as you can see, it is a desert par particulate filter. The model is of Audi A8 car. Uh, uh, the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, it all goes into it. The filter blocks the block. It would prevent the soot particles to uh, pass through it, and it will clean the uh, uh, gas. With the help of this video, I will uh, tell you the working principle of this. <coughs> the SOx contains exhaust, uh, NOx, carbon monoxide, soot, and hydrocarbons. Uh, it passes through a <coughs> nozzle, getting into the DPF. Uh, this is a honeycomb structure, which has uh, the need of the structure is to increase the surface area and uh, add the uh, and for filter the particles inside the exhaust gas. Uh, this is the second part. It is a, a black. A it is a black carbon uh, filtration loop. Uh, it will block the carbon from passing through it. So it will trap all the soot, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Uh, this block is uh, uh, end from that. One end is uh, closed. So due to pressure and speed, the exhaust gas will go and filter towards the wall, uh, and it will trap all the black carbon. Now you might be wondering that what will happen if the filter is blocked. So after regular intervals, uh, we heat up this to 900 degrees Celsius, which will burn the carbon uh, which is present in the filters, and it will clean the system. So it can be reused, and it will be cost eff effective. Next. Hmm. Now, this is a schematic. Uh, I'll tell you about scrubber. This is a schematic diagram of a scrubber. Towards the left, it is a cylindrical scrubber, and towards the right is a Venturi scrubber. Both of uh, them do the same work. They have different sizes. And now, with the help of a video, I will tell you how a scrubber works. At the bottom, you can see there's a nozzle. Uh, it is known as open loop system. Uh, it will make a path for the exhaust gas to flow. The path would be like something like helical, so which will increase the time for the exhaust gases to flow inside, and uh, increase the time for the reaction to happen, and uh, making it increasing its efficiency. Then it will go towards a uh, gas liquid contact area, which you can see on the upper part, the U shape. Uh, the U shape uh, structures are made just to increase the time when the mist from the nozzle comes and uh, it reacts with the gas, which is uh, the exhaust gas, and they form salts. The droplets are then formed uh, at the bottom of the scrubber and they can be drained outside. The water in this area, the water is either seawater, it is either lime, or it is either caustic soda. Uh, then, so that is why it will react with the acidic steam and then form uh, salts, and th that can be drained away. On the top, you can say that uh, it is a mist eliminator. It will eliminate the mist, so the scrubbing liquid which is there inside the scrubber, it can be saved. Also, the mist, harm harmful mist, uh, they do not escape the scrubber and make the environment uh, good. Now the draining system. At the bottom, you can see that all the droplets are falling down from the scrubber. They will be collected. And after the collection of it, either they can be disposed, or disposed of the sea, or it can be reused uh, to a next uh, scrubbing system or cycle. Uh, there are two types of uh, uh, scrubbers. One is dry one, and another is wet. Uh, in, in the wet, there are three types of liquid which are used. Uh, sea water, then uh, lime, and the caustic soda. Now my friend Karan will uh, conclude the presentation. Thank you. So in conclusion, I would like to put it in a way that in order to tackle this fight against these effluents, the first thing which we need to do is emphasize on modern technologies like DPFs and scrubbers. And secondly, we have to make sure that uh, proper sanctions are put up on the violators so that every company abide by the policies made by IMO. Thank you. Go to presentation team. Any questions that you have, please. The time of presentation was uh, 11 minutes and 10 seconds. First of all, congratulations. Very, very good presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, same like the different characteristics of the black carbon, I saw you were very uh, the thing, and your friend Singh was a bit subdued. And all three of you had your unique style of presentation, which was very nice. My one question is, this last scrubber, which you mentioned, yeah? Like, 
where do you find such a thing on tankers? Sir, on tankers, sir. Sir, uh, the scrubber would be connected uh, through the pipe which is uh, transferring the exhaust gases from the engine towards the top of the uh, ship. Bottom of the part which is at the back side of the ship on the top of that part. Uh, and it is a cylinder, we can, we c we can see like a cylindrical part. Uh, have you heard about the inert gas system? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Read it in a magazine, sir, I think. Yeah, you can just have a look. You are just in the first year. Very good effort. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What is the pH value of the overboard discharge or the discharge water from the scrubber? Sir, water? Yeah. Sir, water is around 5 to 6 pH. Okay, thank you. That is acidic, isn't that? Yes, sir, it is acidic. Uh, sir, uh, there are like three cases if we take. Uh, it depends on which liquid which we use in the uh, misting process. Uh, sir, if it is seawater, we can uh, directly uh, drain it. And if it is acidic, then we can uh, again use it and like uh, it can uh, be more efficient and cost effective. Sir, is it hybrid system? Sir, yes, sir. This is the video. It was sir, the video which I showed. It was a hybrid system. Sir, it was using the scrubbing liquid uh, for the next cycle. Questions from the audience, if you have. Okay, sir. If you talk about this open loop system, uh, is there any closed loop system? If it is there, where it is used? Sir, in the case where uh, we will dispose the water. Sir, in which area this closed loop system will be used? Uh, sir, probably in open sea where there are no regulations. Any further questions on this? When you were explaining the diesel particulate filter, you were mentioning that you would uh, uh, actually burn the carbon or you would raise the filter to a higher temperature. Don't you think that would also release uh, carbon in the atmosphere? So what is the process of uh, cleaning the filter? Could you throw some light on it? Uh, sir, first of all, cleaning process, uh, it is known as regeneration process. It will regenerate the heat and again clean the filter. Sir, as you said, as that carbon, it will again like oxidize and make CO2. Sir, for that, there is another uh, system known as DOC, diesel oxidation catalyst, which will block the carbon dioxide from getting into the air, which is used in automobile industry and which can be implemented in maritime sector uh, once we research on it. Okay. And regarding the scrubber, you were saying that you would, uh, there would be two lines of the discharge which would be coming. So would you, as you said in your presentation, that you would directly discharge it on board. So is it right to directly discharge it on uh, board? No, sir. You can either discharge it by watching, uh, by checking its pH value, and you can either reuse it uh, depending on the pH value and the condition of the water. So just based upon the pH value, we can discharge it? Uh, sir, until now, sir, I just know that part. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good. It's good to see involvement of all the students here uh, in asking questions. Good. Uh, so uh, this would be the last paper. Uh, I mean, it was first and last, obviously, for the session three. And the next papers will be after lunch. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. As informed by Sir, we'll be continuing with the remaining three technical papers post lunch, and that will be in the online mode. Now it is time to feed our stomachs with an appetizing lunch. But before we break out for lunch, here are a few important announcements. Post lunch, we will continue with the three technical paper presentations and the much awaited marine quiz competition, followed by posters display and online exhibition of models. All are requested to proceed to hostel number three for lunch. Transportation has been arranged outside. Kindly reassemble your 
by 13.50 hours for the third technical session. I request you all to please remain seated while the dignitaries leave the auditorium. Thank you. Carrots, please remain seated. एक दिवस दाखो नहीं है चप्पल कड़े पैक ना एडप्टर देखी लाइव सोड़ा एक दिन एडप्टर लाइन हाँ फाड़ फाड़ थी बैक फाड़ पलिक पलिक आख खोल का हाँ तो वर से चाहिए चक्का खोल हाँ ती खोल
speakers. Kindly be seated. File phones on silent mode. This in case of an emergency. We welcome you all to day two of the technical symposium Transtech 2022. Institute of Marine Engineers, Pune branch, and the Institution of Engineers, Pune local center, invites revered personalities in the maritime field for a one-of-a-kind exposure through their insights. This year. Transtech 2022 has the honor to have Mr. Prafal Kalankar, Director, SP Auto Engineering, as our guest speaker for today's proceedings. We warmly welcome Mr. Kalankar to TMI with a small token of appreciation. Our regional Coordinator Pune, Virtual Labs Regional Center, IIT Bombay, with a token of gratitude. have among us Professor Pushpadeep Mishra, Senior Project Manager, Virtual Labs, IIT Bombay. We warmly welcome Professor Mishra with a token of appreciation. Was established in 1998 in Induri, Pune, Maharashtra. Among the lush green fields and mountains with a vision to produce the finest of the fine seafarers not only in the country, but across the globe. The cadets in TMI are trained and groomed in all possible aspects of life, be it academics, sports, culturals, or discipline, you name it. The TMI cadets have been there and done that. Here on the screen, we present to you the corporate video of our legacy. The sea might be as violent as it can be, the water infinite, and the waves intimidating. But all this become insignificant when a mariner dons his uniform. Conquering the high seas is no mean feat. Only those with a mighty heart and a steely resolve can accomplish that. Such extraordinary seafarers are made in Tulani Maritime Institute, located in Induri at Talagao near Pune. The sprawling 100-acre campus is an endeavor by the Tulani Group with an illustrious tradition of establishing and managing higher education institutions. Dr. N.P. Tulani, Chairman Tulani Group of Companies and founder of Tulani Maritime Institute, strongly believes in higher education and its advantages. He credits his father for encouraging him to provide higher education in the country. I got the bug of uh, education from my father and it has continued ever since. Our vision at TMI is to be the preferred maritime education and training provider in the industry, meeting the highest global standards. This institute is one of the largest maritime educational centers offering grade one rated marine engineering and nautical science degree programs, postgraduate programs and other courses in collaboration with foreign universities as well. The degree courses are approved by the Directorate General of Shipping, Government of India, MLIT, Japan and MPA, Singapore. The BTEC Marine Engineering BSc Nautical Science degrees and the Diploma in Nautical Science are presented by the esteemed Indian Maritime University. There are hosts of other short-term courses like Electrotechnical Officers course, Command and Control course, and other safety-related courses. At EMI, our focus is to achieve excellence in shipping and maritime techniques. 
But what makes this possible and what creates world-class mariners? It is the holistic impact of the state-of-the-art campus and the overall infrastructure that renders the Institute matchless. The Institute sits in the laps of rural nature, which has enhanced its charm. The Institute benefits aesthetically and academically thanks to a beautiful lake in its midst. The lovely meditation garden on the hill keeps a vigil on the lake. Swimming is an integral part of the training, which is adjacent to the clubhouse. Outdoor sports like football, cricket, basketball, volleyball, athletics, squash, etc. and other indoor games are made available on this campus. The Institute has four well-equipped compact catamaran sailboats to give the students a glimpse of life on high seas. Together we share some really nice moments of our life. With the aim to develop sturdy and healthy mariners, comfortable hostel facility serves them in the best way. The hostel buildings have television rooms, activity areas and well-equipped gyms. The institute features excellent academic facilities. The institute has well-equipped laboratories for demonstrating and teaching the principles of material testing, mechanics, hydraulics, electric control systems, electronic equipment and electric machinery. The world-class engineering systems on the campus like Prabhu Vidya, High Voltage Lab, Hydraulic Lab, Hazard Simulation Lab, Full Mission Simulators, etc. fulfill the requirements of aspiring mariners. Can you imagine some of these systems are almost a replica of the real shipboard equipments? This is an equal opportunity institute. The students are offered merit and need come merit scholarships worth over $160,000 per year. Additionally, many shipping companies also offer merit-based scholarships. As a student and an aspiring mariner, this is the most amazing and apt place I could have been. But the linking bridge between all these elements of the institute and the students is the faculty. The skilled and experienced faculty at Tulani Maritime Institute is guiding light for the proud future mariners. The professional and qualified full-time faculty leaves no stone unturned to instill pride, integrity, determination, humbleness and in-depth knowledge about shipping and maritime operations in the would-be marine officers. After all, it takes more than just the love for swimming to make you equal when the sea presents its worst best. TMI has a glorious legacy of training the brightest aspiring seafarers. But why do students go through these four years of grueling training? To tame the seas and for admiration, respect and honor which come with donning the uniform adorned with stars. It is a job worth toiling for. Some of these students go on to become the guardians of India's formidable coastline. The innovative internship come placements program at the Institute gives its students an edge over the others. The recruiting companies have no second thoughts on hiring students from the Institute. A majority of students enjoy a permanent employment with some of the top-notch national and international shipping companies. I believe that this is where the bright future of shipping and maritime industry in India is assured. The journey, though, definitely does not end here. It is still a long way to go, and they have to prove their mettle. The canvas is huge, the battle challenging. It has been rightly said, that you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. That will surely not be a tough task for graduates from this institute. They have the strong foundation of training at one of the best maritime institutes in India. Any ocean, any ship is easy to fathom when your alma mater is Tulani Maritime Institute.
डॉक्टर संजीव कानोगो प्रिंसिपल ऑफ सी एम आई विद्यालय की तरफ से ओके वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल यू एंड वेलकम टू द सेकेंड डे ऑफ ट्रांसफेक्ट ट्वेंटी टू आई वुड परमिट मी टू वेलकम इन ए डिफरेंट फैशन टूडे आई वुड बी वेलकमिंग अगेन द जजेस मिस्टर अरविंद कुमार मिस्टर भट्ट भट्ट एंड कैप्टन कृष्ण स्वामी हु हैव बिन with us since yesterday they will continue today and uh, welcome to the students from outside this uh, institute uh, i i un understand that there are people from hmt from great eastern so thank you so much for coming i i welcome the participants from colleges who are with us in the board my dear students and colleagues i had this privilege of uh, visiting one of the industries in in our nearby takan area the gentleman deals with uh, very high precision like uh, plastic automobile components uh, one of the highlights of the visit was in addition to the complexities of the parts which he makes he had a very good <coughs> array of histograms pie charts which at a glance was able to tell him and his people that where they were yesterday where they are today and where they will be tomorrow like this people like him should be here tomorrow welcome mr kalankar in fact i had uh, on my on my visit and uh, following my visit i had uh, talked to our mr i said you must visit him you must interact with him because we also need to have such at a glance standing of things which we should be able to peruse and should be able to examine ourselves tmi <coughs> has been on the cusp of uh, development but the covid was a big hindrance for us but nonetheless tmi internal team was able to rise up to the occasion and within the shortest possible time was able to adapt to the online education system and in this mode there are some more faculty who are innovative in nature who clicked on virtual labs and said <laughs> that they can continue the practicals without a glitch then started the idea of how do we contribute and how do we participate this thought process uh, ignited the minds of my team here and they started on the process of on the road map of developing or engaging with v labs there's a lot which can be done in this board boys and girls who are youngsters here who have who should know this that real life practicals are important but real life practicals if they are augmented by virtual labs they add to the knowledge base they reduce uh, wastage and they can give you a your freedom to exercise more experimentals without any additional cost so for this uh, i welcome professor tanuja thakwakar the regional coordinator virtual labs uh, center iit bombay and professor pushdeep uh, pushpadeep mishra senior project manager virtual labs iit bombay welcome a 
Uh, for the benefit of the guest speakers, let me tell you that the Transtech uh, was started with the idea of permitting students from various engineering colleges to present their skills in paper presentations and making models. Uh, the idea of Transtech was to enable the students from various colleges to interact with our students. By interacting with students of various colleges, we learn a lot. Every college, had, every college has certain strengths. This is exhibited during the students' presentations. The event is organized in association with the Institute of Marine Engineers, Pune, and the Institute of Engineers, Pune Local Center. Uh, the industrial revolutions have transformed our uh, uh, technological milieu and the fourth industrial revolutions has made blurred boundaries between the physical, digital and the biological worlds. You have the internet of things, you have the AIs, all these are going to change the life of the professionalism and the working style. So we need to be abreast with that. Probably yesterday we heard and we'll hear some more today that how the young mind are getting adapting to this and how we as teachers should be making you trained to adapt to this. My uh, heartfelt congratulations to Mr. Anirudh Kumar and his team uh, to have conducted the Transtech 2002 at this point of time very well. We have a new addition this time. We have the quiz competition for the in the maritime sector so that you add some value to the transtechs and uh, I wish that it continues further and we should be able to add more value to these forums. Thank you very much. God bless you, Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir, for your words. Being the large scale event that it is, TransTech provides everyone an opportunity to display a technical array of their talents. Like every year, TMI organizes a video making competition, attracting positive competition among the participants and saving one winner. Presenting to you the official video for TransTech 2022 by Cadet Harsh Sharma of second year NA.
the future. Okay, um, our first guest speaker for this session, Mr. Praful Kalankar, is the director at SP Auto Engineering. He's a mechanical engineer with over 26 years of experience in the automotive industry. His experience ranges from fields like quality system management to manufacturing and project management and supply chain management. In 2014, Mr. Kalankar set up his own business after having served several years in the automotive industry. His business has three verticals, which are manufacturing, logistics, and management consultancy. He's gone through various management training programs in India and internationally. His consultancy provides a total solution in terms of establishment of quality systems and some of the areas they work in include ISO and IATF quality system implementation and certification, training on soft skills and behavior skills like quality systems, personality development, problem solving techniques, PPAP, APQP, preparation for VDA 6.3 implementation, etc. The list is really exhaustive. Um, existing systems, ex up upgradation and monitoring and improving overall organization KRA, establishment of operation and finance MIS, plant level structured improvement programs through various modules like 5S, green productivity, machines and quality management. Like I said, the list is very exhaustive. I would now like to invite Mr. Kalankar to deliver his talk on quality, on total quality management. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to tell you anything different. Basic, basic things I'm going to tell you. How the theoretical things has to be implemented in the practical. That means every industry, and I strongly believe that, ki theory has to be implemented on the shop floor of every industry. Then and then only we will get the best desirable result. That is the only objective of this session. And uh, 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 I think I am having uh, 30, 40 minutes here to deliver my speech. But I would like to cover most of the things, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, TQM, total quality management. So total, total quality management, uh, this terminology is not a very, you know, different. But there are a lot of techniques are coming. Day by day, it is changing. It's the thoughts. New thoughts are uh, coming uh, in the industry. And uh, quality, bef because in order to understand the totality of the TQM, we have to understand the terminology quality. Quality of the service, services, quality of the product. So that quality may be in terms of reliability. The quality may be in terms of sustainability. So these are the two important things which we are going to cover in today's session. Basically, this presentation uh, will contain uh, what is TQM. First of all, we will see ke exact what is the definition of the TQM, principles of TQM, and then if we implement this in a systematic approach, systematic way, then what will be the benefits of TQM in the industry Re and requirements for successful implementation of the TQM in any industry. Basically, total quality management is a customer-oriented techniques, basically. And it's a process for continual improvement by adopting a uh, lot of uh, new things on the shop floor. But it is a systematic approach towards the quality. That is all about TQM. 
total quality management is a management approach that seeks to provide long-term success by providing unparalleled customer satisfaction through the constant delivery and quality services. Actually, this concept is not the responsibility uh, to achieve the quality, is not the responsibility of individual or a, 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 a single person. This is the responsibility of everybody, whoever are working in the organization or in the team. That is, it creates the working culture in such a way that ki there will be a uh, there will be a system and process oriented approach. TQM is considered a customer focused process that focuses on consistently improving business operations. It strives to ensure all associated employees work towards the common goals of improving product or service quality as well as improving the procedures that are in place of production. TQM is not only related to the manufacturing sector, but it is related to the all services, service segment also. Total quality management process is the ongoing process. It is not the one-time process. This has to be inbuilt in our working culture. That is the overall objective of the TQM. If we implement the TQM in a structured way in any industry, the, your supply chain management will be smoothened automatically. Then the overall quality of the product will enhance to the extreme level. After that, your, the cost of poor quality will also be reduced drastically. And at the same time, your customer satisfaction will be highly effective. Now we will see the principles of TQM. There are a lot of principles, that means, but basically, we are going to see these most important principles of the TQM. First is focus on customer, that is employee's involvement. I already told you this is not the responsibility of single person, but it is the responsibility of individuals who are working on the shop floor. Process-oriented concept, because whenever you are going to start any activity, you have to have a very systematic approach. It will start from the planning and ends with the monitoring. Monitoring all the activities. You must have heard the PDCA cycle. Plan, do, check, and act. This is a very important concept which plays an important role in the TQM process. Integrated system. That means there has to be a very proper communication among the team and all the parameters should be integrated to each other. Strategic and systematic approach, decision making based on facts. Whenever we are going to take decision in industry, that will be the database decision, not on the, uh, this one, you know that uh, gut feelings. In, we have seen lot of things, in many industry, lot of things are carried out on the gut feelings. If there is any issue, major issue, yes, it might be, there might be this problem. We spoke like that. But this concept is working on the dis, uh, data, actual data. Then communication and then continuous improvement. We will see one by one, that is, what is the focus on customer. Now the customer first, that means customer is, all, is on the top priority, on the top. TQM first and foremost pillar of the success is an unwavering focus on the customer's experience in all interactions with the organization. From first contact through purchase and continued support, the customer should always be the main priority. That means when you're looking at the customer, customer should be the first priority because our business is so solely depend upon the customers. Your customer should be delighted. And he will not be delighted only one parameter or two parameters. There are several aspects which is impacting on the customer satisfaction. At the same time, the customer satisfaction is not <coughs> only depend on the activities which we are carrying out on the shop floor in our industry or in our area. <coughs> but at the same time, we have to be very much focused with the activities that is, you know, the external activities <coughs> that is supporting activities which we are getting the support from our suppliers also. <coughs> Then service relationship with the internal customers. I think you must be familiar with the customer concept. 
customers is not always with the external customer only, but there are internal customers also. Because unless and until we understand, we recognize internal customer concept, we cannot satisfy the end customer. End customer is always one customer, that is the end user. That is the end customer. But in the industry or in, the, in our uh, working area, everybody is a supplier and customer to each other. So that concept has to be kept in our mind <coughs> before going to start any activity. How my customer, that is the next operation, will be satisfied. That has to be understood by individuals. So that is called a service relationship with the internal customers. Our next operation holder or next customer should be happy. Internal customer should be happy. That has to be kept in our mind. Customer driven standards. Whatever we are doing in the operation, uh, in the process, that is for the customers, end customers. So first of all, be be before going to start any activity, we have to follow the APQP concept. <coughs> because the time is very less, that is why this, this uh, session will not be interactive session, I feel. The APQP, that is Advanced Product Quality Planning. APQP concept is a very important concept in any industry any service industry that is again related with the PDCA cycle. Before going to start any activity, we have to have a structured plan on the paper. Without planning, if we are going to start any activity, there are 100% chances of getting failure. Because we are not, because there is not a, uh, you know, that is structured thought, which is, which has to be put on the paper. So first of all, we have to do the planning in a very systematic way. So APQP, that means APQP, this concept is always used in the new project. There are various types of gates, basically. First gate is the design concept. Whenever we are going to start any activity, any development activity, that time we have to start with the planning approach. And the customer's requirement what is the customer exact customer requirement that has to be identified in a very structured way that is whether it is feasible to us or not what are the risk analysis it's a very small small parameters has to be considered during this process then the fa the last is that is never compromise on quality quality is never compromised because the quality should quality is not a separate things separate requirement from the customer it should be the inbuilt quality in your service or in your product <coughs> then employee ownership i already told you ki this is the responsibility of total team team members everybody if you look at this uh, this one uh, this slide everybody is working separately but they are busy in their own activities TQM requires the involvement of every team member to ensure that complete quality control is offered at every level. That means that quality control or that quality assurance concept should be involved at each and every level of the organization. This is not the responsibility of only quality department or you know manufacturing department. It starts with your sweeper because quality is always built from the five years activity. So that is that means your sweeper is also a play, plays an important role in the quality. From sweeper to the top management, top management should driven this activity basically. And if you drives the activity in a very systematic way, you will get the exact desirable result at the end of the day. And TQM does not focus on a single department because the goal is to provide customers with a great experience from every level of the organization. The employee involvement, how it will, how it will be groomed? There will be required extensive training because everybody has to involve in each and every activity. So extensive training is required in order to grow this activity. There has to be a team formation, excellence team has to be there. Team means their roles and responsibility has to be defined. What will be their care? towards the common goal. If there is a team, that means there is a common goal. To achieve that goal towards quality, we have to have a 
individual role and responsibility and at the same time monitoring of the activities and their results that is very very important if that activities are we are doing and we are not getting the results as per the desired uh, thought process so then we have to go for the again we have to review the cycle and again follow the same level that means it's a cycle basically pdca cycle measurement and recognition that i already told you we have to measure our activities in such a way that whether these activities are giving the des desired result or not that we have to analyze then we have to follow some suggestion schemes so that this activity will again be strengthened it's a process based the next principle of the tqm is process based tqm focuses on the creation and implementation of processes that provide organizations with the ability to find success and repeat it quantifying success and defining the steps taken to get there are essential for successful implementation of tqm thinking about the process because once we have done the activity it is not the one time activity and your every process should not be depend on the individuals or that operators or that uh, uh, manager so it has to be a process driven basically so for that there has to be a thought process ki how the process will be there how the flow will be there what are the steps we will have to follow to complete that process that is very very important and process means we have to derive the steps to get the desired result and every steps will be monitored then handling of the process is equally important that means process flow diagram you must have heard the sop standard operating processes any operations when you are going to do there has to be sop in every organization if sop is there that means we are not dependent on the person we are dependent on the processes that means which is laid down on the uh, in the industry quantifying success and defining the steps taken to get there are essential for successful implementation of tqm processes which has to be a result oriented one system integration tqm strategies revolve around leveraging every asset available to the company this is best achieved through system integrations that combine disparate parts of the organization into a single well oiled machine working in a complete synergy actually system integration means everything should be there has to be a smooth flow of the operation there should not be the intervention of anybody in order to create a smooth flow so in that way the your process how you design the process that is more important in the system integration concept then identify the supporting application if it is distracting or it is disturbing your main activity then we have to think about the uh, supporting applications also we have to identify the required infrastructure or uh, we can say that the uh, required uh, uh, resources then in terms of man that means we have to identify in many cases we have to identify the uh, training needs also if there is a training required special training is required to perform the particular activity that time we have to identify the training needs communication the communication tqm in tqm practices the communication is very very important you must have uh, noticed that there are in a, there may be some of the member who hide the problems there should not be the hiding the problem if problem is there that problem has to be placed on the surface and every member is supposed to interact within a team with very transparent problem means there has to be a approach of yy analysis why the problem has arise where has arise who has noticed when it has arise how it has to be that means you have to ask five w five y questions to yourself 
then you will come to the root cause. Ki what is the problem, exact problem? We should not find out the solution on the basis of our gut feelings only. There has to be a, there has to be a very systematic approach towards finding out the solution. Unless and until we find the root cause, how we will go to the uh, solution, it will be very uh, difficult. That is why there is a fishbone diagrams concept in the viva analysis. We have to identify all the potential causes, all the potential uh, this one failures, so that each and everything will be think in a systematic way. Communication should be in open forum. It should be because we have to educate the people how to communicate to each other, how to uh, place the problem, how to uh, do the problem definition also. Many times, because of the wrong problem definition, we will not able to reach the root cause. Many times it happens. Now, uh, if we are, that means we will discuss with you because uh, uh, I am having my own uh, four factories, manufacturing factories. One factory is uh, related to the painting process, uh, spray painting, that is uh, in, in interior and exterior part. So painting is a very special process. Unless and until you paint the parts and when it comes out of the uh, oven, then you will come to know the quality of the product. That is why it is called as a special process. So before, before starting of the process, we have to take extra precautions. Extra precautions in terms of the paint which you are using, what are the processes you are doing with the paint, that means what are the process parameters you have to follow, what are the process controlling methods, that is pressure, temperature, then uh, you know, uh, that is viscosity of the paint, these are various lot of processes. So that means this is the process designing approach. The process designing approach does not tell you only to design the process. But at the same time, we have to be very particular about the parameters which has to be controlled during the process so that it, the final result which is coming out of the process, it will be exactly as per the desired results. So there is a quality plan also for this. Quality plan, what is quality plan? Quality plan means we have to have a, every parameters has to be listed down. Quality parameters related to the product. That means what is the exact requirement of the final product. At the same time, what is the requirement of the process, process parameters. If viscosity, but how much it should be. There has to be a clear cut sheet which will be indicating you that everything is available on the sheet. That means any blind person can process the uh, things and you can get the good results. It will not be uh, only depend on the person. So that is why the quality plan, quality parameters that has to be decided uh, uh, at initial stage. It should be data driven. Data driven means unless and until we don't have data, uh, 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 we doesn't have data, data should speak the actual status. Many times we discuss on the gut feelings. Team comes together, X person will tell you, ki, yes, there might be these, these reasons. Second will tell you, this, this, there might be. It is not the systematic approach. It is a gut feeling only. You cannot find out the root cause in this process. There has to be a very systematic approach. And I feel that uh, uh, the next, I'm going to take the lot of sessions in your uh, college. And uh, in that, I'm going to tell you the exact uh, implementation, how we are going to implement on the, our shop floor. So we have implemented a lot of things, that is PPAP, APQP concept, Kaizen concept, on day-to-day -day basis. Recognition of the Kaizens, what, are, what should be the, everything should be in a systematic approach. Then and then only you will get the results. Continual improvement process. TQM is not a one and done process. Perfection is impossible. So it must always be pursued to get the organization as close as possible to it. Continuous improvement, when you can uh, see the improvement, if there is no measurement, there has to be a measurement of each and every parameter. 
then and then only it is possible to count where th that means where you are we are going so that means measurement is the first technique then there has to be excellence team cross functional process management has to be there attain maintain and improve standard so this is very very important that is principle of uh, uh, continual improvement what is uh, uh, i think there there is a difference between continuous and continual we always believe on the continual improvement we should not go straight directly we should go then there has to be a uh, sustenance part so that we will there will be sustenance after that again we have to grow then again sustenance so that everybody will understand the process results and whatever things we have done that means how we can sustain it sustenance part is very very important in the industry this month we have achieved zero ppm and next month again 1000 uh, uh, ppm that means the result in the first month it is by luck it is not this result is not by the process design process so that means the sustenance part is very important so you grow sustenance grow sustenance that is called as a continual improvement and that this continual improvement is very very important in the industry there are lot of benefit but out of that benefits uh, we have picked up three uh, major benefits are there uh, uh, from the tqm tqm will increase the awareness of quality culture in the organization you must be aware that there are lot of uh, you must have heard the name cost of poor quality cost of poor quality is not only the cost of bad products cost of poor quality include the cost of inspection also that means our processes are not so robust which is manufacturing the good product from your from your processes that means we are not confident about our product which are manufacturing through the processes design processes so that means we are applying the inspection process there so inspection is a extra activity customer will not pay for that inspection so it's a muda muda is a japanese word it's a wastage wastage of time wastage of resources wastage of money so that means poor of quality is always count as a inspection process also then the that means the second poor of quality is the bad products bad quality which we are getting from the process that is the uh, cost of poor quality customer communication customer will raise the complaint then we are uh, transportation Th all this comes under the uh, cost of poor quality so that is why the cost of poor quality is always in the multiples of the manufacturing of the uh, cost of the manufacturing of the product so that is why there is one concept that is first time right every time whenever you are manufacturing the product it should be first time right and every time it should be right that is the concept on which we have to work a special emphasis on teamwork will be achieved here in this process if we are going to implement the tqm in our organization their culture built teamwork culture built teamwork culture is a very very important if we want to achieve extra uh, for our organization tqm will lead commitments towards continual improvement continuous improvement and continual improvement टीम को पता लगेगा कि यस मेरा कमिटमेंट है मुझे करना ही है तो दैट कमिटमेंट्स इंप्रूव इफ यू स्टार्ट इंप्लीमेंटिंग द टी क्यू एम रिक्वायरमेंट फॉर सक्सेसफुल इंप्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ टी क्यू एम इफ सपोज वी वॉन्ट टू इंप्लीमेंट द टी क्यू एम वॉट आर द थिंग्स वी नीड क्वालिटी इंप्रूवमेंट इन ऑल एस्पेक्ट मस्ट बी एवरी आर इंप्लीमेंटिंग लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स इन यूर इंडस्ट्री दैट इज एवरी मंथ वी आर कंडक्टिंग कम्युनिकेशन मीटिंग इन दैट कम्युनिकेशन मीटिंग we discuss about what are the last month achievement what are the last month failures what are the last month customers feedback who who was the best employee of the last month who has contributed lot towards the quality all that things we discuss with our employees and we recognize their efforts whatever they have contributed in the last month continuous improvement this is the requirement of the successful implementation for tqm then customer focus control i have already discussed with pdcs 
cycle. Ensure monitoring and control checks for any de any deviation. Recording in progress. The intended course of implementation. Thank you. This is all about uh, our TQM. TQM is a very uh, uh, this one you know systematic journey where we can implement very small small things in our organization if we want to achieve a good results in terms of cost effective in terms of customer satisfaction in terms of you know the cust uh, employees motivation also we are we can motivate the employees also in this case we can motivate all the students and this is very important from the safety point of view safety whenever you go whenever you work this is applicable in our in your human life also this is very very important concept quality management thank you <laughs> one more thing i would like to advise all the students before leaving this organization because after this education you are going to join somewhere okay so first of all you have to understand ki what is the expectation from your employer from your organization from you that is that has to be understood by you unless and until you understood you understand the what is the exact expectation from the uh, organization you will not able to perform by your own so that is very very important you have to understand ki what is their expectation from you in terms of all the things that means what is the company's common goal how you are going to contribute towards that that has to be uh, think deeply you can ask me any questions on this topic yeah please sir sudeep ray is not able to join as a panelist sir uh, he is in the waiting room he is not able to join as a panelist process oriented yes yes this is a very this one but this this approach is customer oriented approach this is the exact difference iso nanthajan process is nothing but it is a you know a systematic uh, let down the procedure but we have to Hello, uh, Rahul. Probably you can start the presentation. Sir, recording sir, in uh, progress. Sir, so Sudeep is having the presentation, sir. So, sir, uh, he'll be able to share the presentation, sir. Yes. sir ha huh. done sudeep so done are you ready hello yes, yes you can start the presentation sudeep uh, you can share it you can share the screen okay okay i'll be on mute and i'll be on hold please hello uh, you need to understand the rules first the total time will be 12 minutes first warning will be given at 10 minutes and then after 12 minute negative marking will start so you try to plan your presentation according rahul i hope you have understood yes please share the screen and start the presentation please can you share the screen Yes, I'm sure.
with my voice is good or it is is it lagging your screen is there please start sir am i audible correctly sir your audible rahul you start yes a very good morning to all the judges and the fellow participants i rahul kumar singh along with my team teammate Sudeep Ray and Sumodhi Chakravarti will be presenting this paper on fuel cell as an alternative fuel, as an alternative propulsion. Sorry. At present, most of the energy is derived by combusting the fuel in the internal combustion engines, boilers, and gas turbines. In these prime movers, the emission level is very high. At present, the majority of the fuel what we use in these prime movers are HFO and NGO. The emission from these fuels is very high, so there is a need of an alternative. Which can reduce the dependency on the fossil fuels. To comply with the emission control targets set by IMO, alternative fuels can be alternative fuel can alternative fuel and without combusting the fuel. earlier we mentioned about the emission control targets emission targets for the fuel so the i so i am any fuel is emitting the fuel targets to reduce the co2 emission by transport by what is what is what is meant by 20% percent or less in an emission control area since there is no gas is coming directly from the emission there is no contamination of the atmosphere especially marco lanex is regulation 13 That is HFO, NGO, LNG are at present used in fossil fuel and there is higher demand. That is why I am giving the higher demand for the fossil fuel. Why is the demand for the fossil fuel high? Because of the high demand for the fossil fuel. Temperature proton exchange membrane fuel cell or the solid oxide solid oxide fuel cell, or after reforming they can be used in the fuel cells. But during reformation, CO2 will be produced, and after that the hydrogen will not be pure hydrogen. H2 can straight away be used in the fuel cell in a low temperature PEM fuel cell, but this hydrogen has to be produced renewably so that the life cycle emission is kept zero. We can go to the next slide. so uh, discussing our fuel that is hydrogen so there are types of hydrogen brown hydrogen that is based on processing of coal gray hydrogen that is based on processing of natural gas blue hydrogen is the processing of fossil fuels plus carbon capture utilization and storage green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources like uh, via electrolysis using water please make right yes sir yes sir this one types of fuel cells the three most promising fuel cell technologies on the basis of fuel used are pmfc for pure hydrogen that is proton exchange membrane fuel cells ht is for like high high temperature proton exchange membrane fuel cell for methanol or diesel third one is sofc for hydrogen or different hydro hydrocarbons that is solid oxide fuel cells now now my teammate since pmfc is zero emission technology so we will only discuss the PM, pmfc That is proton exchange membrane fuel cell. Now my teammates will be prepared to continue the paper. Over to you, Sudeep. Thank you, Rahul. Now we will see what is fuel cell and how it works. 
Fuel cell is basically an electrochemical cell that converts the chemical energy from fuel into electricity and the emissions are only water and heat. From the diagram, we can see that one side is anode and the other side is cathode. In between them, we have an electrolyte membrane. Hydrogen enters at the anode and oxygen enters at cathode. At anode, hydrogen breaks into an electron and an hydrogen ion. The hydrogen passes through the electrolyte and combines with oxygen and uh, at cathode and forms water. The electrons go through an external circuit from anode to cathode and uh, that is how we get the electric output. Now we will see what are the reactions taking place in a fuel cell. At anode, hydrogen breaks into H plus ion and electron and at cathode, oxygen is combined with electron and, and forms water. Onboard application of fuel cells, how it can be installed control system, uh, uh, which is getting its input from power and energy management system, uh, remote diagnostic system, vessel automation system, remote user interface and local user interface. On the left hand side, you can see the fuel cell control under which there are uh, two fuel cell stacks which are uh, generating the DC current. Output of the fuel cells are connected to L filter and uh, which is basically removing the disturbances from the output current and then they fridge according to the load and then the output is connected to onboard DC grid for uh, for the DC equipment. For AC current, it uh, can be connected to DC to AC converter with a transformer and then it can be connected to MSB. This is the layout of ship which is using fuel cell as an alternate propulsion. It shows the location of various components on the ship that is fuel tank, air inlet, fuel cell water output and warm water output. Now we will discuss about the efficiency of fuel cells. This diagram is taken from ABB and uh, from the diagram we can clearly see that the fuel cells are having higher efficiency in comparison to combustion engines and favorable operating range for fuel cell is between 30% and 80%. Uh, fuel storage options for storing hydrogen. First is compressed hydrogen storage which store hydrogen at 300 to 700 bar. Second is liquid hydrogen storage in which the fuel is stored at a cryogenic temperature of minus 250 degrees Celsius. And this system has more storage capacity than compressed hydrogen storage. Third is the onboard hydrogen production. It can be used in methanol and LNG carrier where hydrogen fuels is integrated with reform. Thank you. Now my teammate Sumajit Chakrabarti will continue. Thank you, Sumajit. Let's start fuel cell and putting in the Energy Observer launched in April 2017, the first vessel autonomous in energy, hence to a mix of renewable energy and renewable hydrogen produced on board. Next slide. The world's first hydrogen carrier, the Sushio Planter, built by Japan Kawasaki Heavy Industries, runs between Japan and Australia. Next. Next slide. Now coming to advantage. Sustainable vessel. These hydrogen fuel cell emit only water and heat, which make it one of the most environmental friendly fuel and also durable, which supports in sustainable vessel operation. This fuel cell power plant extends the vessel running hours in zero emission mode. Next, chatter and port process. Due to zero emission from this fuel cell, the vessel powered by these cells are capable of complying with the regulation areas such as zero emission port. As the, no as the number of moving parts vary is less in comparison to IC engine, maintenance required will be limited, which will result in lower maintenance expense and it also ensures optimum lifetime and performance. Let's come to challenges. Onboard hydrogen storage. 
volume goes the energy density is low so more volume is required to carry same energy low temperature storage next capital expenditure it currently too expensive due to lack of demand mainly the cost of fuel cell stack and hydrogen storage next fuel cell durability and reliability the alternate method is not so yet as durable as internal combustion engine and do not perform as well as in extreme environment such as in sub freezing temperature getting hydrogen to ship new facilities and system are needed for producing and transporting and dispensing hydrogen to ship and this is a new innovative and present system are not competitive next safety as hydrogen requires low ignition energy and also has wide explainability range it is more prone to fire hazard now next rahul can continue thank you somaji so pure hydrogen fuel cells can be the solution to achieve the control emission targets set by imo the production of green green hydrogen is comparatively less only 2% in the world right now so by investing in the green hydrogen production and making proper bunkering facilities and infrastructure for hydrogen fuel fuel cells can definitely make the earth green these are ref our references and bibliography we would like to thank our faculty s parantaman sir we are thankful to the transcript team for giving us this opportunity and we are very thankful to the judges and the fellow participants for listening to us very very patiently thank you thank, thank you everyone please can unmute the screen now hello good so it was nice presentation by you all uh, thank you sir. i'll just uh, hand over it to judges for questions questions please you mentioned that hydrogen cell you use electrolyte what is what electrolyte is that what is that so i don't know exactly what is the electrolyte but okay. also you use in one of the block diagrams l filter what is this l filter sorry sir what is l filter l filter sir it is a lc filter basically which is removing the disturbances from the output dc current this electronic filter you can use sorry sir Is an electronic filter to remove the disturbances and the current radiation from the light. Right? The yes, yes, sir. And uh, what is the carbon footprint of producing one kg of hydrogen? And what is the calorific value of one kg of hydrogen? Are you here? No, sir. We don't have. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. You said hydrogen can be produced on board. If the hydrogen producing apparatus is not on board, how will you replenish the hydrogen from where? How we will liquidize to replenish? Replenish. Yes. Bunkering. Where? From where you take bunkers for hydrogen? From where? Are the facilities available anywhere? Yes, sir. sir we can have the setups available for that for uh, that could that the windmills and all could we like the hydrogen could be produced renewably on a land based area and then it could be transferred on ships or we can also have uh, some arrangement on the ships uh, from which the uh, hydrogen could be produced renewably not in that much of quantity but any for any emergency use but the main the, but the main bunkering of hydrogen will be from the land based areas sir Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. My question is, uh, since we all know the hydrogen gas is extremely uh, flammable, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So uh, you did not touch up on any of the safety precautions that may be taken. Uh, have you done any kind of a study on that? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, the hydrogen gas is having a flamm flammability range of like four to seventy-five percent. That is a very Uh, wide flammability region that will give a lot of problem 
but we have added in our slides sir, that uh, by giving uh, strict handouts to the by giving proper training to the teachers and by uh, drafting a certain set of uh, guidelines and uh, standing rules for the seafarers this thing could be avoided but uh, then the sea can be rough things may not be in the seafarers control all the time yes sir yes sir so there are there, sir, uh, definitely sir there will be certain parameters that we will uh, that, that, that we need to work on sir and sir uh, uh, right now what we can do is what we can prepare uh, the best for uh, using this technology that will be by providing a proper uh, training to the seafarers for the persons who will be using or dealing it with and sir also by having proper guidelines and all very stringent regulations of how should how they should operate these fuel cells and how should they you know deal it with on board thank you so as the flexibility reason is very high sir, so definitely we need to work on it sir. the one more thing just you said the sulfur cap is not for auxiliary engine lifeboat engine fire pump why sir uh, the sir that is because sir the emergency sir. but that is you know, on board because of emergency we can at the time of emergency we can't think of em uh, emissions so that you is the reason any other fuel for that yes sir the so, pardon sir please repeat so, can you please repeat the question please? no can you use any other fuel for more with more sulfur content for these engines no sir sir the uh, the fuel that we are using for uh, 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 the fuel that we are using for emergency gen emergency generator sir that is having a plus point of 43 degrees celsius sir so we are having a certain set like certain guideline that this this property of fuel that we will be using over there but if any malfunction happens in that engine at the time of emergency we uh, we are not uh, we will not be thinking about the emissions that we have to follow the emission regulations right now only Thanks. A small question. I there was a graph which was uh, talking about efficiency of fuel cells, which is higher than the combustion efficiency. Can you justify that? And the graph of fuel cell efficiency was flattening after some particular time so why it was why this kind of trend there Sweet, you will take it uh, yes sir that diagram we have taken basically from abb and uh, it is uh, the fuel cells are having efficiency that is from 30 degree 30 percent to 80 percent but in combustion engines we have a efficiency of 40 to 50 percent so According to that, uh, we have taken from the data that but also yeah. there is a vessel named uh, Hydro Village. So we have mentioned that in our uh, slide, but we have not uh, repeated it. We have not uh, showed it. Sir, uh, that uh, vessel is giving an uh, efficiency of 40 to 70 percent. So based on that vessel and sir, other vessels we have uh, searched upon, so we, we found out a trend of that uh, depending on the fuel cells, there was for some fuel cells were giving 40 percent some sorry some fuel cells were giving 60 percent some were giving up to 80 percent okay and sir one more point i need to add that in ic engines the losses are more as compared to fuel cells what is the cost of production of fuel cells hello yes cost sir. of production yes i can answer it please. yes Sir, uh, initially the cost of production definitely will be high, sir. Uh, we don't have a perfect figure about that, sir. So, but uh, with the help of uh, uh, certain parameters like economies of scale, by getting subsidy from the government. So, sir, by these things, we can bring down the cost of the fuel cells when it is widely accepted, once it is widely accepted, sir. So, sir, uh, like these, uh, following these things, sir, we can bring down the cost of it. The, the question is like, what is the cost currently? At at present, what is the cost of the fuel cell? 
so we don't have any accurate figures. Okay. Uh, indeed, it was very good question and answer session. Good. So you can, I mean. Thanks a lot, sir. You can leave the session or you can be there in the participants. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very thank much you, for being with thank us. Thank you. Judges, their timing was 11 minutes. Thank you. Hello? Ratha, are you there? Ratha, can you say that? Praveen Singh and Parag Bhatti. I can see. Sir, Ratha, what was the last one? I don't know if there was some exams. Praveen Singh. Hello? Praveen, are you there? Yes, sir. We are here, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, his presentation is on Praveen Singh. IMO's DHG strategy, how to beat 2030 and 2050. He's from IMU Chennai. Yes, sir. See, the presentation total timing will be uh, 12 minutes. First warning will be given after 10 minutes, and then you have to finish your talk after 12th minute. So, sure, ready? Ready with the presentation, Praveen? Yes, sir. Okay, you please share your screen and start with it. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Praveen Singh along with co president Koti Tagore to discuss on IMO GHG strategy how to meet 2030 and 2050 goal and to discuss on a new initiative introduced by. Uh, can have a look on the contents. We'll start with the introduction. IMU is basically international maritime organization which works on the shipping industry to promote encouragement in the new advancement in technologies and to promote in the reduction of global emissions of carbon dioxide and to reduce GHG emissions. As we know, our world is getting warmer from last 100 years. The average temperature of Earth, which causes rising in the 0 0.8 degree Celsius, which also increases ocean acidity, shrinking of ice sheets, increase in sea levels, as twice as quickly as during the last centuries. As we can see in this left side graph, how it was starting from 1901 to 2020, this graph has been taken from the IMO site and uh, this study source uh, from the IMO port uh, study. It's rise rapidly twice as it was earlier. We'll discuss about the vision of IMO. Actually, the vision of IMO is to reduce GHG emissions, or we can say uh, by 2030, they will reduce by 40% and by 2050, they have a target to reduce by 70% from 2008. What the actually strategy and what they are doing now in the current scenario, I know till now remains committed to its reducing GHG emission from international shipping and as a matter of urgency, aims phase them out as soon as possible in the century. They also adapted mandatory measures like Marpol Conventions for uh, Pollution Prevention Treaty, Energy Efficiency Design Index, EEDI, mandatory for new ships, and the Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plans. These are all the mandatory uh, regulatories and the rules they are implying, and they are making our sea experience and sea uh, pollution less day by day. 
we'll discuss now about the emission from the transport sector include shipping rail and heavy duty road vehicles these are the major contributor for the emissions of co2 per ton million actually in the comparison of other transportation and all shipping industry or shipping uh, emissions is very less compared to another industries like on rails as we can show uh, we can see in this graph co2 intensity gram co2 per ton million in shipping industry we have, we have less compared to another transport like rail or heavy duty road vehicles we know transportation also a key contributor uh, of uh, and accounting for about 14% of global ghg emissions now we i already discussed the shipping is the most efficient mode of mass cargo transport and it's also reducing its ghg emissions there i am also taking so many undertaking studies like uh, recently they uh, introduced imo fourth study and uh, uh in their study in 2018 they concluded that the shipping industry was responsible for approximately 2% of global carbon dioxide emissions uh this may not sound a lot but in comparable to emissions from ghg emitting countries such as germany and uh, here's another a table in which it they shows uh how four time or ghg studies done in two in comparison with 2012 global anthropogenic co2 emissions was 34793 carbon dioxide per ton and now in 2018 it's 36.573 we can see on the right side why based international shipping as percentage of global we are rapidly con constanting this table like in 2012 it was 2.1001 now in 2018 2.02 and recently they will uh, take this uh, study in further now we'll discuss we have discussed what the shipping industry is doing what the imo is doing for so we'll know about we should know about the ghg and its effect actually if you can see in this photo this photograph we can easily understand what the ghg global house gases which comprises mainly of co2 and other gases in the atmosphere which traps heat keeping the earth warm in this diagram you can see a blanket which is forming between this space this atmosphere when the radiations come from the sun these radiations get trapped in this blanket of co and this because of this we are uh, facing the heat problems uh, our atmosphere getting warmer and day by day for these to contribute in the imo strategy we have introduced uh, superconductors it's not a new but in 1989 also uh, this project was uh, set up but due to the more cost it was uh, not taking in the industry about superconductors actually we think that it's a boon toward the environment and the industry too as there will be no pollution on using this technology superconductors are the conductors which produce massive magnetic flux and uh basically made from nebbium titanium conductor and uh, we believe it creates a more and uh, electric electricity on comparison to another uh, normal motors we'll talk about this uh, superconductors and all how we can use in the ship uh, actually to move the ship uh we are using ic engines and all in today's life it's also a very boon which reduces the human labor and uh, increases capacity of doing work of the transportation sector 
normally in this superconductors critical temperature of nbti we have take 10k and to increase the critical magnetic field limit by this we as we can see this setup actually japan has uh, introduced this is in uh, in their bullet trains and all and we also can use in our ships actually if we start this machine we instead of normal uh, magnets if we taking this we can get the uh, result for sure as uh, in the in this diagram number 1 it's give for mcmacon refrigeration cycle this blue pipes where we can see uh, second tradition scenes which consist of uh, nitrogen oxide liquid helium liquid nitrogen gases of both helium and nitrogen gif and this compressor which we which is the most uh, uh, famous uh, named as gifford mcmacon compressor it's uh, we initiated a small diagram uh, or a new approach uh, as we can see in this uh, diagram we'll arrange the superconductors around the rotating coil because of this uh, we will have high magnetic flux to make coil rotate while compared to normal magnets as we discussed earlier it's is perpetual motion equipment and should apply some torque to start the motion at the start we are applying some torque by some external means known as started it can be generated only for start mentioned in the figure and then when super magnet motors we start rotating with the help of starter this started super magnet motors makes other super magnet motor rotates with the help of conveyor belt these rotates each motor simultaneously and makes electricity to flow through the wires connected and we get high amount of electricity because of high magnetic flux by superconductors in which some electricity is used to rotate force motors as these superconductors will give immense electricity if it starts it will never stop we can this uh, and have a switch and all what we can say we can disconnect this it will give us immense electricity and by belt one rotates and this process continues we used secondary motor electricity to rotate the first motor whereas we also get electricity from first motor which is stopped by introducing diode to make second motor not taking electricity and to make flow of current through one direction so that we will get maximum electricity in our diodes at last conclusion we all know pollution is a major condition in today's world which needs to be reduced in shipping industry is daily get uh, putting great efforts to reduce fuel consumption and to get rid of pollutions uh, which shipping industry in today's life and uh, also see our future generation to be good at this and uh, imo strategy also can be updated and day by day they are working to and uh, thank you and Boti Tiger will handle for the question and answer session. Thank you. Good presentation, Praveen. Your total Thanks, time sir. was 11.32, 11 minutes and 32 seconds. Uh, any questions, Jesus? Yes. You mentioned some material for making superconductors. As far as I know, basically it was made of ceramic, different kind of ceramics. And what is the temperature required to maintain that superconductivity? So actually for nicodium titanium, it is required is 8 Kelvin. But we may now we have recently they have uh, introduced some other some superconductor also like uh, magnesium magnesium boride. Which is uh, which is uh, two forty three Kelvin, but for this for uh, which we mentioned in the presentation for it we required eight Kelvin. So we are using helium, uh, liquid helium and liquid hydrogen to maintain the temperatures. Now the basic idea is to reduce the CO two in the atmosphere, right? 
Yes, sir. Sir, we we using this. We we do we will not have any use of pollution, sir. We yeah, need, I, uh, gas will not be released. I think so. It's completely electrically based. What I have heard, some research is going on where you can burn magnesium in presence of CO two. And if you take big enough slab, not very big, you can reduce CO two by fifty percent in the atmosphere. Is it correct or not correct? Uh, I actually I didn't heard that anything about it, sir. Sorry, sir. Yeah, just think about it. Instead of doing all these things, you can just sir, burn some magnesium. Sir, uh, we that IC engine we well compared to while well, using IC engines, lot of we lot of. Or money is wasted on diesels and fuels. So, uh, while you introducing this at one time, one by making this engine once, it will be a long time machine without any cost. So the shipping, uh, shipping charges will be very very neglected. So much neglected, we the diesel cost will be negligible. So by this, I think so. While but by introducing that, uh, by as you said, by burning magnesium, it might. No, it might be uh, boon to environment, but not the shipping industry, sir. It will be cost. The cost will be same, but only the pollution concern is minimum. But uh, while we are introducing this type of engines, we will be. It will be boon to both environment and both shipping industry. While but cost will be very much, very much reduced, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ceramic, you said, is used for uh, production of uh, <coughs> CO2, CO2, reduced to CO2. Is it economically viable to use ceramic? Sorry, sir. Is it ceramic is economically viable nowadays? I don't get you, sir. Ceramic. Ceramic, 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 and how much economically is it viable to use that on board now? Sir, actually, while we are we are we are putting all the cost at a time. At the starting, we are putting every cost. But while uh, actually while we are shipping, while we are shipping, we generally put an amount. We generally generally take money bits of bits. That's we are compared to that. We are putting all the money at the start, and we are letting it to go for. Um, long years, but actually our engines, which are working, which, uh, which which our shippings are working now, will have the money at some some bits. They will get uh, some some time means they will continuously put money on it. But our our project was to just put money at once, and the result will be so long. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, good presentation. Just one uh, small thing. Your uh, uh, the thing the topic was uh, greenhouse gases strategy, correct? Yes, sir. But you pertained only with the carbon dioxide. Am I right? Have you done uh, any think... research on uh, methane or any other uh, uh, greenhouse gases? Uh, uh, our main topic was not not only CO two, sir. The, all the gases which were released by the shipping industry, sir. Every and gas which is and all that. Yeah, so no. the shipping industry is also responsible for methane, especially yes, when you're getting uh, large volumes of coal. Our project is to eliminate pollution, sir. We by introducing our mission, there will be no no gases released to the environment. Yeah, but no, what about the all. methane and all that coming out of the cargo? No, sir. The nothing will be sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, good. It was a nice question and it was a nice question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, good. So you can you can maybe leave the session. Next group, Ratha. Yes.
हेलो आकांक्षा राठा यू आर देयर यस सर यस सर यू कैन हियर अस प्रॉपर्ली यस सर गुड सो द प्रेजेंटेशन इज ऑन रिव्यू एनालिसिस ऑन एडवांसमेंट्स इन एनसी एसआर टेक्नोलॉजीज यू आर फ्रॉम आईएमयू विशाखापट्टनम यस सर so you can share your screen and you can start with the presentation okay sir we we'll like to begin yes we are thankful to transit 22 for giving us this prestigious opportunity to present our paper titled a review analysis on advancements in ncsr technologies sea going is a perilous task as the working medium is quite unpredictable the only way to survive the waves is an instant harmonization to the impulsive sea conditions through prudent utilization of the available amenities and efficient action reaction sequences at unfortunate juncture to override the hurdles of the industry there was certain technical evolution from sapomos and flags to the current technological standard in come let's begin While shipping is the most international of the world's industries, it is considered to be very challenging given the comprehensive figures of catastrophic consequences in the form of accidents, disasters, loss of life, property, cargo, and environmental damage cited in the statistical specifics. To make navigation and ZAR operations brisk, lenient, and efficient, paramount research and developments have been configured in maritime communication networks, protocols, and techniques. Hello. Are you facing any problem? Yes, sir. We have a network issue. Pratha, hello. Audible? Are you audible? Yes, you are now. Please continue. Okay. Advanced communication techniques with many underway R and D. To the conclusion, we would like to analyze the perils associated with the evolving technologies. Let's start with the latest simulations in maritime navigation. So I call upon Rudita Nair to explain this. About thousands of years before the European na navigations, Polynesian navigators used the characteristic double-hulled canoes to navigate the entire Polynesian Triangle, just relying on pure wayfinding techniques. Today, the invention of GPS in 1970s revolutionized the maritime navigation that was previously dependent on gyroscopic compasses, radars, radios from the beginning of 20th century. Solus regulation adopted by, uh, by IMO lays down the carriage requirements for shipboard navigation systems, and today, more, the modern navigation systems aboard a ship includes gyro compasses, echo sounders, radars, autopilot, speed logs, ARPAs, ECDIS, AIS, and many more. First, let us find, uh, look. Let's uh, look at the automatic identification system. AIS is an automatic vessel tracking system that provides real-time information about the ship to other ships and the coastal authorities. The we uh, to improve maritime safety, the vessel traffic uh, the vessel traffic service personnel on on shore uses the AIS information to calculate the closest point of approach and time to closest approach. But then the, the AIS system cannot be dependent on because there might there might be situations where the smaller vessels do not have an AI system deployed, or where the vessels turn off their AI system, or their uh, or uh, maybe an accident might have taken place. Therefore, integrating AIS with aid to navigation devices such as buoys, lateral marks, lighthouses to transmit live data pertaining to sea state, weather conditions is a viable option. Also, virtual AIS, AIS ATNs is a novel technology that can generate apparent ATNs in remote areas where a physical ATN cannot be deployed. Now, automation is a navigation technology that is emerging in the marine industry. Presently, autopilot autopilot systems control heading of the ship automatically, primarily using a gyro compass. Modern autopilot systems today are synchronized with other navigational system devices to form an interconnected network of sensors that collect. 
transmit and analyze data, thereby reducing the risk and decreasing the need for human intervention. Also, integrating autopilot, uh, autopilot systems with artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality has been gaining much interest lately. AI displays can be used to identify the ship routes, uh, navigational aids, and congested seaways, while AI technology can be used to generate warnings against possible collisions. Therefore, it has reduced the workload of uh, the personnel, were personal and has uh, improved the navigational process. Next, I would like to pass on to Akansha. Coming to the competent technologies and protocols in maritime SAR or search and rescue. Given the humanitarian precautionary regulations and rendering of search and rescue services defined under the SAR convention to the people in distress is an important aspect. When in 1912 British luxury passenger liner RMS Titanic sank thousands of lives were perished under the waters, Solus, that is this demand, basically two components to evolve in nature over time. First, alerting. Second, locating. The maritime industry was initially clung to Hello. We are not able to receive your voice. Hello. Functions. Uh, you you got disconnected. Hello? Sorry, sir, we had a network issue. So, can you hear us? Are you audible, sir? You can start. Hello. Are we audible? The screen is still coming. You can hear it. Please clear the screen as well. Your screen is there, you please start. We are very sorry for the network issue that yes. we have. We would like to continue. Screen is there, you please start. Yes. 
the initially clung to conventional shipping methods and protocols. But today, when robotic assets have taken over maximally to the requirements, uh, maritime operations also club together with unmanned practices for search and rescue operations at sea, given the need of ensuring the safety of the rescuers. Manned rescuing is substantially going to be cut off and replaced with unmanned operations, what we call unmanned technologies, because of external factors such as the lack of visibility or adverse atmospheric or marine conditions, which can put the safety of the rescuers at risk as well as delay the rescue operations. The circumstances thus suggest the need of switching to robotic or autonomous devices in the turbulent, ever-changing sea conditions. First up in the list, we have an USV. An USV is an unmanned surface vehicle, which is a vessel, also has an additional autonomous behavioral payload, which is capable to perform intelligence and surveillance operations. A notable example of an USV is the M75, which is an autonomous rescue vessel. It is dedicated for, it's totally dedicated for maritime surveillance and rescue operations. It's integrated with comprehensive searching, data communication, and rescue models. It is also retrofitted with a photoelectric pod, which enables it to search at night and take high resolution pictures and videos for evidence. It uses LTE communication to communicate within 15 kilometer radius to the base station and can run at a maximum speed of 13 knots and thus can respond to emergencies promptly. Next up, we have UCAP or the unmanned capsule. These are small sized platforms that carry along with them a life raft that can be inflated close to the victims. And the very known drones, within minutes of, reach, reach, within minutes of search, the drone can find the target and release a fast rescue boat and a mothership for rescue. Then next up, we have the trap model. Traps are the transient attracting profiles, which are short-lived regions where water may converge and be likely to pull objects of people and are easily interpretable. It uses the computational fluid dynamics method, the Eulerian approach, which uses most reliable velocity forecast snapshots close to the point where a missing person regions of the ocean at a given time. These predictions can get continuously computed and updated when the next batch of velocity information becomes available. The picture uh, on the screen depicts the animation of a typical trap model mechanism. Next up, we have a very simple and flexible communication method, the vessel triage. When an accident occurs, the crew, regardless of its training, is almost always faced with a unique situation. This makes it difficult to assess the situation and make decisions. This is when the vessel triage method comes into picture which uses a simple threat factor matrix, which can quickly communicate, uh, can quickly make an objective assessment of a vessel's condition and communicate it immediately to the base station. Uh, it follows a four colors. It follows a color scheme which has four colors: green, yellow, red, and black. And the descripts are in the screen. Next up. We have advanced maritime communication techniques. I would like to pass over to Erin for further. The earlier navigators tried to navigate by simulating their elemental senses, like auditory and visual systems. For the need of increasing reach and efficiency, led to the deployment of advanced maritime communication methods. First of all, let's go through the evolution of maritime communication, which happened in five stages. One, the bells, horns, flares, flags, speaking trumpets, cannon firings. Stage two, to increase the reach, we converted into lighthouses. In three, we went most codes and telegraphs. Four, maritime communication networks, which are classified into six. And five, we are looking towards the future. Up in the list, we have GMDSS. GMDSS is a computer-driven satellite cum terrestrial radio-based system. With its expansion, vessels were made capable of not only being able to transmit distress signals to shore, but we also receive are. radio communications in form of shore-to-ship distress alerts. For vessel locating, Azad, place the role of a signalman, transmitting and receiving radio signals and enabling quick detection with its bright color. Additionally, AAS transponders usually help with information on ship's identity. With the evolution NAVTEX and AAS systems, further advanced to corresponding NAVTAT and VTEA systems, enabling a wider maritime data exchange. It resulted in a scope of parallel modernization of GMDSS and supported the development of the maritime cloud, also improving SAR operation efficiencies. Next up in the list, we have magnetic field communication. As evident from the name, while all other existing underwater communication systems employ waves, 
This method makes use of a field, which is non-propagating and instantly created entity with no multipath and Doppler effects. Moreover, the very same magnetic field can be utilized to recharge battery powered vessels like AUVs and ROVs. Last in the, in the list is interface communications. TAR, Transitional Acoustic Radio Frequency, is a Finnish novel technology invented to transfer information across the interface. The existing technologies has been proven incomplete. We love to conclude. The improving array of technological breakthroughs on the world stage expected to be highly disruptive, but there are mounting concerns that these technologies will pose serious challenges. Technological advancements will not suffice as a replacement for humans, and therefore we suggest a mandatory thorough ship-specific and hostile cyber breach scenario-based training for the workforce to develop their quick response and defense strategies in the face of evolving threats. We therefore envision risk technologies. Thank you for patient hearing. We are open for questions. Good. It was very good presentation. Your total time of the presentation was 12 minutes and four seconds. Uh, before going to start with the question and answer session uh, for your presentation, I would like to summarize the session and then probably I can come back to the judges and then they can continue with the questions. So this session included four technical papers. All the papers talked about applications from the marine industry. Uh, they talked about different technologies which have come up uh, and people have started using these new technologies on the ship. So the first paper was presented by TMI team, which was on black carbon as a form of greenhouse gas. The second, second paper was on the fuel cell as an alternative for propulsion system. Uh, recently, we use combustion systems on the uh, ships for the propulsion purpose. So we are opting for uh, different technologies, like we are moving from the engines to, you know, electric driven technologies where fuel cell is one of the option which is available, which has good efficiency compared to combustion systems. Then the third paper was presented by uh, Praveen Singh, which was talked about different IMOs, uh, GHG strategies. In his presentation, he uh, mainly focused on different uh, use of the superconductors uh, on the ship. And the last uh, presentation was on review analysis on the advancements in NCSR technologies, which was by Ratha and team by IMU Visakha Patanam. So they also talked about, you know, uh, recent technologies which are coming up uh, from the shipping industry. So I would like to mention uh, special thanks to all the participants for being with us. And I request judges to please continue with the questions of this session, this paper. Over to you, sir. Good. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, it was a very nice presentation. And uh, anyway, it may be of some interest to you. You are the only one all girl team. Okay, so uh, that that always adds uh, some glamour to the, I would say, the function. But anyway, uh, jokes apart, uh, you had used the word triage. Up to now, I was under the impression that it is a medical emergency term. So can you please tell me on what context it was used and uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, sir. It's almost similar to the medical triage. As we uh, treat a patient and how do we analyze the patient's situation, that's why we use triage in uh, medical science. In a similar way, here we consider ship as a patient and not the passengers. They're very clear about it. The Finnish uh, government has implemented this in this particular aspect where you consider the ship as the patient. They're looking at the seaworthiness of just the ship. And we could use a color, a color code. And here, ship is the patient. Okay. 
you should have mentioned this you know because i was from that time onwards i was wondering how this word was used over here anyway thank you so much for clarifying the doubt okay yeah one more thing with a improvement in communication don't you think uh, this improvement in communication has made life more difficult for the seafarer especially the master who has no time to do the navigation loading or anything else but just to send and receive the messages sometimes he has to send a similar message to seven parties eight part maybe 15 parties you know with little difference there little difference there and until he has sent the last message i mean the last message to everybody he cannot go to sleep and sometimes it takes 12 to 15 hours and the next port is 12 hours away only pilot is on board and he is not finished with the message from the previous departure so when we we'll have time to look at the navigation and what he will do with the safety and everything sir along with the evolving technologies it is very important that the skill set of the people also improves uh, it cannot always be in conventional methods everything has to improve hand in hand so it cannot be like we improve a technology but we don't train people to improve along with it so to make things easier to make communication e easier navigation also has to be made easier that will be my answer navigation has not become easier it has become more difficult because in case you lose all the instruments how will you navigate the ship people don't know how to take a sight now and point a location on the map that we are here and we are going in this direction so it can be counterproductive also it uses excessively there should be a balance but now we are over using the communication technology at the least, at least that much and uh, i think things are not in some instances things are not that safe as they were earlier on when people have time and don't tell me we have to train the people like that we are already training the people but a man is a man and a machine is a machine machine does not require rest engine can run for 40 days continuously a man cannot yes sir we understand the safety understand. aspect of the ship goes for a toss more communication is good only when it is used in balance with safety keeping in mind the welfare of seafarers and if seafarers are well cargo is safe ship is safe safety is paramount i mean there's nothing more important than the safety but if you don't have time to sleep what can master do what can mate do i mean what can second officer do what can anybody do do for that matter or you keep two masters or put on radio radio officers back on the ship just to save money on communication you remove the radio officer so owners want to make money and make the ship some safe don't you think so so uh, uh, see this is just a food for thought okay your paper presentation was excellent please don't uh, get disappointed by anything it is just a food for thought okay Uh, yes, sir. we understand. We understood. We understood the point also, and we also agree with this. And we, it, it is our intention that see, all the uh, uh, from uh, last five thousand, ten thousand years, there is no uh, mark two. Man has not become mark two. Like how every year a new version of a computer or a mobile phone is coming out. But what was five thousand, ten thousand years back? Man, he's the same. No, he's prone to all the same uh, problems. So that's the reason why I told you. Yes, sir. Along with the technology, the industry should also focus on the improving the mental health of the seafarers as well. So we totally agree to the point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, one one point also got a point. You, this is under navigation, communication, search and rescue. Nowadays, polar region has become very delicate subject. So what has been done specially for polar regions for this? Search and rescue. So, uh, in uh, we uh, we have, we know that uh, since Arctic ice uh, melting is a very big issue right now. Even uh, last, I, I believe, uh, two weeks back, we had had a satellite uh, report saying that uh, the ice melting uh, has caused a lot of navigation channels to open up. And uh, one such uh, most important channel is the uh, Northwest Passage that is uh, becoming free of ice. And there has been uh, several projects.
X that is going on to improve the navigation in those channels. Uh, we have not uh, deeply researched into those, but we are aware of the, I means we know that some uh, some uh, research and developments are going on. You know, what, uh, what this NCSR has done for polar region, especially for search and rescue. Under, under the SAR convention, there is uh, individual countries are coming up and uh, setting up a global search and rescue plan. So uh, they communicate as they, the rescue coordination centers and sub-centers, these have been established and they cover the world's, all the world's oceans. So they cover the polar regions as well. So this is also being taken up under the SAR convention. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, sir. Thank you. Sir. You answered very well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank, thank you, thank you sir. sir. We have witnessed 12 excellent paper presentations. And with this, we have come to the end of the third and final technical session. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mane Deshmukh for chairing this session so fluently. And as a token of appreciation, I'd like to request Dr. Anirudh Kumar, convener of Transtech, to present Dr. Mane Deshmukh with a memento. The three technical sessions have been informative, and I'm sure that everyone who has been attending them has gained quality, valuable knowledge. I now request the participants of the quiz to come up on stage.
Cadê o? Cadê o?
kindly rise please be seated we will now begin with the much awaited quiz competition at the outset i'd request you all to keep your phones on silent mode to avoid unnecessary disturbances i'd also like to acknowledge the presence of mr virendra gill who's an ex marine engineer and currently the director of forbes marshall he's representing amazing nautical association today mr gill would be sponsoring the prizes of the marine quiz competition we welcome sir with a token of appreciation As industry professionals, all of us gain a substantial knowledge base as we progress the field through the years. But to recollect those tiny essential facts while being arrowed down with a series of hyper-intelligent questions is a niche very few possess. What I'm referring to is the art of quizzing. And for the first time ever, Transtech has introduced a quiz competition, wherein participants will be grilled with questions based on topics related to marine engineering, nautical science, maritime history, international maritime conventions and basically everything related to our maritime industry this year we have three teams of two members each competing for the position of the ultimate quiz overlord we have teams from hindustan institute of maritime training the great eastern institute of maritime studies and tolani maritime institute I will now introduce you all to the participants. From team GIMS Lonavla, we have Cadet Ojaswi Saxena and Cadet Karan Malia. From team HIMT College of Chennai, we have Cadet Shashikant Mishra and Cadet Sudeep Ray. From team TMI Pune, we have Cadet Rishika Nayak and Cadet Karthik Thakur. I will now introduce you all to the general instructions of the marine quiz competition. There will be four rounds in all with a fifth tie breaker round if needed. Round 1 will be general MCQ. Round 2 will be rapid fire. Round 3 will be a buzzer round. Round 4 will be an audio visual round and round 5 will be conducted in case of a tie breaker. The rules and regulations of each round will be explained before it begins. The contestants must consult each other before giving out the answer. Round 2 doesn't allow discussion among team members. Each question must be answered in the allotted time. In case of any issue, the quiz master's decision would be the final one. Audience are requested to remain silent when the question is projected on the screen. I now call upon no, I'll introduce the rules and regulations of round 1. The round 1 is the general MCQ round. Each team will have a quota of 4 questions. In this round, the questions will be passed to it from the previous team that did not answer. A team will get 30 seconds to answer the question intended for it and is awarded 2 points for answering it. If the team for which the question is intended for gives a wrong answer, the quiz master will give the correct answer. If the team for which the question is intended for passes the question, the next team will get 15 seconds to answer it and is awarded 1 point for the right answer. The team members can discuss before giving the answer. If a team cannot answer a question, they can pass it or after 30 seconds it gets automatically passed to the next team. If a team is answering a question and the time passes, then the team gets the time to complete the answer and is awarded points for the right answer. There is minus 1 negative marking for wrong answer. There is no negative marking for passed questions. No buzzer will be used in this round. Now call upon Cadet Lucky M Astaya to conduct this quiz.
All right. Thank you so much for calling me up here. All right, teams, I have some general instructions for you as well, OK? I want you all to get familiarized with some music, OK? The timer, the end of round, and the scoreboard, how it sounds, OK? So timer would be sounding like this. Rohan? <laughs> All right? OK. And the next thing is the end of round. And the end of round would sound like this. <laughs> Sounds like KBC, right? OK. And then we have a scoreboard. So a scoreboard would sound like this. All right? OK, so now I would like to call upon a stage our Institute Cadet Captain, and I request him to conduct the round one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think now in this quiz, only Amitabh Bachchan was missing. So <laughs> no, I'm nowhere close to him. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I've got the height, but that's not the only thing that is required. Anyway, so first of all, um, from my own side, I would request everyone to have a huge round of applause for all of the teams. Um, it is extremely easy to sit and enjoy the quiz, but it is very tough to come forward bringing your college's name and trying to participate in the quiz, so they deserve a lot of credit for it. And the same goes to the team which has prepared, led by Lucky, who have prepared this quiz. And this is the first time which it is being hosted at TMI. So I think uh, we all will enjoy it. And starting off with the first round and the first question, which is <laughs> meant for team A. So can we please have the question? Great Eastern, yes, team A. IACS means, or you could say IACS stands for and the options are International Association of Certification and Survey. Option B, International Association of Charters and Ship Brokers. Option C, International Association of Classification Societies. D, none of the above. C. OK. So the option chosen by team A is International Association. Option C. And let us see what is the correct answer. Yes, option C is the absolute correct answer for this question. And team A has started their sale very strongly. And the next question goes to team B, which is team HIMT. So the next question for team HIMT is uh, rung in ladder diagram consists of, and your options are A, input and output, B, a horizontal line, C, a logical block and output, D, all the choices are true. Pass. Okay. So team B has decided to pass this question to team TMI. So team TMI, what is your answer to this question? Question passes to our team A. It's C. C. You're, you're choosing option C. Okay. So the option C, let us see if uh, that is the right answer. Wow, that is absolutely correct. I mean, this, this music sets the vibe. So team TMI, next question is for you. Team C, team TMI. So the question is, for which purpose the centrifugal pump is not used? For which purpose the centrifugal pump is not used? 
and the options are a steering gear b main engine lube oil pump c main sea water pump and d boiler feed water pump a steering gear okay so they have chosen the option a steering gear so let us see if that's the right answer yes option a is the right answer moving on to team a. once again can we have the question please flow of cooling water in cylinder head is from dash your options are a top to bottom b bottom to top c one side to the other horizontally d none of the above top to bottom a okay that was quick so they are moving forward with option a can we please check if option a is the correct answer Oops. that is not the correct answer it is b bottom to top uh now for our next question we will move to team himt and can we please have the question for them which type of scavenging is preferred normally in modern large two stroke engines and the options are option a loop scavenging option b uniflow scavenging option c cross scavenging option d blow back scavenging B uniflow scavenging. Uniflow option B. Yes. Okay. So team HIMT is moving forward with option B. Can we please check the answer? Yes, it is the right answer indeed. Uniflow scavenging is the correct answer. Now moving back to the home team, team TMI. And the question for you is Boiler screen tubes are used to protect which of the listed components from high furnace temperature? And your options are Option A, superheater Option B, refractory Option C, wall tubes Option D, steam drums Option A, superheater Okay, so Team TMI will move forward with option A. Can we please have the correct answer? that is the correct answer now we move back to team a which is gems so the question for team a is what is the latest amendment related to marpol annexure 6 and the options are a sulfur content less than 1% b sulfur content less than 0.5% C sulfur content less than 2% D sulfur content less than 3.5% Option C It's B Okay so let us see they have chosen option B That indeed is the right answer sulfur content less than 0.5% Everybody is almost answering correctly I wonder everybody did study at home. <laughs> so moving back to team HIMT. The next question is <laughs> Cylinder liners are made progressively thinner from dash and your options are A top to bottom, B bottom to top, C it is uniform from top to bottom, D none of the options. bottom to top option b bottom to top okay let us see if that is the correct answer it is the incorrect answer option a top to bottom is the correct answer okay let us move to team tmi home team once again bluish smoke in exhaust indicates what 
Your options are A. Excess scavenger B. Excess combustion air C. Excess fuel oil D. Excess lubrication oil Option D. Excess lubricating oil Okay, so team TMI is moving forward with option D, excess lubricating oil. Can we please have the correct answer? It is indeed the correct answer. Now we go back to team A and the question for you is... What is the height of the tallest wave ever recorded? And your options are around 100 meters option B around 200 meters option C around 480 meters and option D around 520 meters Now this question passes to team HIMT. C480 meters. Okay, so team HIMT has decided to move on with option C, around 480 meters. Let us see if that is the correct answer. That is not the correct answer. Around 520 meters is the correct answer, but that was a past question. So. Now the main question for team HIMT, the next question is <laughs> On which date did the SS loyalty set out on her maiden voyage? And your options are A. 5th May 1919 B. 5th April 1919 C. 4th June 1920 Option, option D Option number B Option number B uh, 5th April 1919 Okay, so team HIMT has decided to move forward with option B and let us see if that's the correct answer. That is the correct answer. They did not let me complete, so they were quite sure of this. So, moving to team TMI. The next question is... The term MCR in PLC programming stands for... A. Maintenance and Control Regulator B. Master Control Reset C. Main Control Relay D. Master Control Regulator C. Main Control Relay Okay, so Team TMI has answered Option C. Main Control Relay Let us see if that's the correct answer is not the correct answer option B master control reset is the correct answer so I think this thank you this concludes our round one and it was quite an interesting round and now uh, are we going to have the scoreboard
Okay, so we have this course. At the top we have team TMI with total points of five and team GEMS has four points and team HIMT has three points. So let us have a huge round of applause for them. With this we will move forward to round number two. you all to the rules and regulations of round two. Each team will again have a quota of four questions and in this round they will be asked four questions one after another. A piece of paper will be given to, written down, to write down the four answers which shall be collected at the end of each team's turn. On the immediate completion of a question each team gets five seconds to answer it. If a team is not able to answer a question they can pass it for the next question. There is no team discussion in this round. Three points is awarded for the correct answer. There are no negative points for the wrong answer. Once a question is passed, the team cannot give an answer later. No buzzer will be used in this round. All right, so teams, are you ready for the round two? Okay, so we have given you the blank sheet, right? You are supposed to write down the answer after mentioning it in five seconds, okay? All right, so the series of four question is to team gems. And the question is, How many stars are used for navigation? I repeat, how many stars are used for navigation? 57. Can you repeat? 57. 57, All right. And now the next question is, the sinking of which Ocean liner gave rise to the Solas Convention. And the time starts now. Titanic. And now the third question is How many member states are present in IMO? Okay, now the last question. Which ship was stuck at the Swiss Canal in March 2021 for a brief period of six days? Evergreen. Evergreen. Could you please on your mic? So I request the teams to please write down the answers and give it to me. All right, so let's see the answers of all the four questions. And the answers are, The first answer is 58, and the second answer is RMS Titanic, and 174, and the fourth answer is Evergreen, ever given. Okay, now I would like to go with the team HIMT. Now it's your turn. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So let's see what is the first question. <laughs> International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from ships is commonly known as Marpol. Okay, and with this we, we are moving to the next question. The next question is National Maritime Day is celebrated on 
5 april 5 april write it down okay the third question s o p e p stands for or sopep stands for okay the time is up and with this we are moving to the question number 4 to h i m t when outside a special area uncommuted food waste may be disposed at sea at what distance from nearest land 50 nautical miles sorry could you please repeat 50 nautical miles 50 ha huh. all right so let's see what are the correct answers for all the questions and the correct answers are the first marpole and the second is 5th april and the third shipboard oil pollution emergency plan and the last one is 12 nautical miles so with this we are moving towards team tmi team are you ready yes all right kartik So the first question for team TMI is now on your screen Who invented the first marine chronometer Come on quick Time is up now the second question for you is The approved diagrammatic representation of all fire fighting equipments are done in fire plan all right let's let's move to the third question which maritime disaster gave birth to the ism code come on The time is up. Now the last question of this round is to team TMI and the question is now on your screen which code have been issued under both SOLAS and MARPOL All right with this let's see what are the correct answers and the correct answer for the series of four questions are now on the screens and the answers the first answer the one who invented the marine chronometer is John Harrison and the second one is the fire control plan the third one is the sinking of the herald of free enterprise and the last the imdg code the international maritime dangerous goods code okay all right with this hooter sound we have reached the end of this round and now let's see the scoreboards All right so we can clearly see that team HIMT is leading with 9 points and then we have team gems with 7 points and team TMI at 5 <laughs> What is happening Karthik All right no worries so now I would like to call upon a stage cadet tsunami to brief the teams about the rules and regulation of the next round So round 3 will be a buzzer round which will have in all 15 questions each the 15 questions will be fired at all the teams one after the another the teams can discuss among themselves and then press the buzzer or the bell to answer the question first no discussion is allowed after pressing the buzzer the team that presses the buzzer first gets a chance to answer it 
three points for the correct answer and minus one point for the wrong answer. If a question is not answered by the team after pressing the buzzer, minus two points for pressing the buzzer and not answering. That is a false buzzer. If a team presses the buzzer before the question is over, they will be asked to answer it without the question being completed. The question has to be answered in 15 seconds. If a question is not answered by the first team who pressed the bell, the team that pressed the bell next gets to answer. There are no choices in this round. Quizmaster's decision would be final. All right, welcome back to the Marine Quiz event presented in TMI. Okay, so teams, I request you all to please check your buzzer. Okay, Karthik. Okay, team SAMT. All right, so all buzzers are working. <coughs> all right, so the first buzzer round question is now on your screen. Which specifications or qualities? Total base number, TBN. <laughs> we will not consider your answer. I briefed you earlier. All right? OK, no issues. Let's move to the next question. Yeah, it was right, but we will not consider it. What? All right? Because I've I have briefed you earlier that I'm supposed to complete. I told you earlier that I'll recite it first, then you're supposed. I have. Just a second. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So we will consider your answer. Your answer is correct. Your answer is correct. Please give a huge round of to the team, James. Teams, you know what you are supposed to do now, right? Okay. Yeah. Whenever the whenever you see the questions on the screen, you can press the buzzer. All right. The moment you see the question on the screen, you can press the buzzer. All right. So, the next question is Which gauges are generally used to evaluate main bearing clearance? Yes, Team Bridge TMI. Gauge, bridge gauge, bridge gauge. Let's see what is the correct answer. And the correct answer is telescopic filler gauge. All right, so with this, let's move to the third question of buzzer round. And the question is, now on your screen, modern four-stroke medium in speed engine, marine diesel engine. OK, team TMI. Rotocap. All right, so let's see whether Karthik is correct or not. And the answer is Rotocap. Please give a huge round of Applause for TMI. <laughs> All right, with this, let's move toward the next question. And the next question is <laughs> What is provided on cylinder heads of marine diesel engines to relieve any excessive pressure within the combustion chamber? Relief valves. Let's see whether the team James is correct or not. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Please give a huge round of applause for Team James. The next question is... Dumping of waste at sea is governed by which convention? Let's see whether you are right or not. Team, your answer is not correct. The correct answer of this question is London Convention. 
let's move to the next question name the first aircraft carrier of indian navy very good team hmt come on ins vikrant all right let's see whether team hmt is right or not ins vikram aditya yes you are absolutely correct ins vikrant Which year did the ship? The uh, 1912. Year 1912. Let's see. Team Jim, you are absolutely correct. Year 1912 is the correct answer. Let's move toward the next question. What two water bodies? All right. Come on. Atlantic and Pacific. Oh. Okay, let's check. And the correct answer is Red Sea and Mediterranean Sea. Okay, okay, no issues. Let's move toward the next question. Which identification of vessel will never change even if owner or flag changes? classification society okay so let's check whether you are right or not and the correct answer is imo identification number okay with this let's move towards the next question and the next question is now on your screen global maritime distress safety signal safety what global maritime distress safety signal symbol signal signal all right so let's see whether you are correct or not and the correct answer is global maritime distress safety system yes <laughs> your answer is not correct Okay. Okay. So let's move towards the next question. Which number shows the ability of a fuel to resist the knocking? Yes, team TMI. C10 number. Okay, let's check whether you are correct or not. And the correct answer for this question is You were so close, but the correct answer is octane number. But it was not mentioned which type of fuel it is. C10 for diesel and octane for petrol. So you need to have the correct question. All right now I would ask this question to our vice principal Emmy sir <laughs> so, All right sir the scorekeeper please do the needful All right the next question is Yes. Longitudinal access tool holding equipment. Could you please equipment. say a bit louder? Longitudinal access tool holding equipment. Equipment. Okay. Let's see whether you are correct or not. Yes, you are absolutely correct. The right answer is longitudinal access tool holding equipment. With this, let's move towards the next question. Clearance between the wall stem and rocker arm. Tapered yes. clearance. Let's see whether you are right or not. 
Tapit clearance is the right answer. Team TMI, give a huge round of applause. Okay, now the next question is now on your screen. Full form of SD, SD, SD. Time is up. Okay. So the time is up. Let's see anyone from audience. Full form of ST, SD, SD. <laughs> All right. So let's see what is the full form of ST, SD, SD. And the full form is security training for seafarers with designated security duties. With this, let's move towards the next question. The next question is now on your screen. Ipub. Emergency position indicating radio beacon. Okay, let's check. The right answer is Emergency position indicating radio beacon. You are absolutely correct. Okay. Let's move. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. So I now I would like to see now. Okay, so let's see the scoreboard. Okay, so let, we can clearly see that team TMI is leading. And then we have team James followed by team HIMT. Now I would like to call upon a stage, Cadet Tsunami, to brief the teams regarding the rules and regulation of round four. The round four will be an audio-visual round. The rules and regulations for this round are, audio-visual round will have three plus one question each. Each team will be shown a picture with a quotation. The team has to complete the quotation. The team has 15 seconds to answer the quotation. The teams will be made to listen to an audio clip. Questions will not be passed to the next team. No negative points for wrong answers. Three points will be awarded for the correct answer. With this, we will move forward to round four, which is the audio-visual round. And the first question is meant for Team Gems, Team A. Name the symbol shown in this picture. There is a symbol in front of you. You have to name the symbol. Live boy with light and smokes. Light and smokes? and smoke. Okay, let us see the correct answer. This live boy with light and smoke signal. Okay. So, let us move to team HIMT, team B. Can we have the question for them? Name the personality in the photograph. Who is this man? I 
I think the time is up. He is Kitak Lim, the name of the person. Now we will move to team TMI, which happens to be on fire. So the question or the photo for you is... Resham Nilofar. I never asked you that you have to name her. <laughs> no, but your answer is absolutely right. It is Reshma Nilofar. Next question back to team A is... What is the technical term for this diagram shown in the picture? Load lines. What line? <coughs> load lines, load lines. Load lines. Okay, let us see the correct answer. It is indeed the correct answer. Plimson line or the load line. Next question is meant for team HIMT. So can you please have the photograph for them. Which type of fire extinguisher is shown in the picture? Carbon dioxide. Huh? Carbon dioxide. Okay. Can you please have the answer? Yes, indeed. It is CO2 type fire extinguisher. I would request all of the audience to kindly maintain the decorum. Do not disturb or even tell them the correct answers. Let the quiz happen in, in its most fair form. So, next question for team TMI. <laughs> Name the flag shown in the picture. Zulu. Zulu. Okay. Can we please have the correct answer? Yes. It is the correct answer. Next question meant for team A, Gems. Can we please have the photograph? <laughs> what is being represented by this photograph? I had collision situation. What? I had collision situation. I had collision? Achha, ahead, ahead, okay. Does anybody in the audience would like to attempt at this? Yes, it is the Williamson turn. Let's move to team HIMT. Can you please have a photo? What is happening or being done in this picture? CPR. Okay, CPR. Can you please have the correct answer? Yes, it is CPR. I think anybody who has done EFA of the ST STCW course, we would know. Next question for team TMI. Can we please have it on the screen? Name the equipment shown in the picture. Name the equipment shown in the picture. Please remain silent. The time is up. Audience, now is your time. HRU, yes, it is. Which? Wrong. It is hydrostatic release unit. It is hydrostatic release unit. Okay. Now, again, just to remind you all, this is a buzzer round. All the three teams, this is the final round of the quiz. So, all of the three teams are participating in it. And this is the audio time. So you will hear the audio. Once the audio finishes, only then you are supposed to press the buzzer. After the question. Obviously after the question. But do not press the buzzer before this particular audio is finished because then the purpose is defeated. So please let the audio finish. Then we will display the question. Then once the question is on the screen, you can press the buzzer. I have a question. Yeah, as soon as the audio ends. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, will Lucky uh, repeat the question or uh, do we have to just uh, press the buzzer as the... You can press the buzzer as soon as the audio is ended. Okay. Repeat the yeah, it would be right in front of you. I'll repeat it. No problems. But you can press the buzzer after the audio is completed. Okay. Okay. So the audio starts now. 
Bravo, bravo, bravo. The audio is finished now. Can anyone from the two teams would like to attempt at this question? Please reset the buzzer. Man overboard. Man overboard. Team gems. Yes. General alarm. General alarm. General alarm, general what alarm? Seven short blast, one long blast, general alarm. General alarm. Okay, so after the two attempts, we will have to move to the third team, team TMI. Please answer the question. Yes, man overboard alarm is wrong. Yeah, that's why we are moving forward to the next team. Team TMI. General emergency alarm. Let us have the correct answer. It is the general emergency alarm. So with this, I think we have come to the end of this quiz. And again, let's please have a huge round of applause for all of the participants. You might be thinking sitting there that answer is not happening here. So please appreciate them. And huge round of applause for the organizing team. This is the first time TMI had hosted its technical quiz here at Transtech, which in itself is a milestone. Tsunami. Okay, so who, so spectacles is this? You can collect it from the anchoring team. It will be right here. Thank you. Who's? Okay, <laughs> I'll give it to you. Uh. After careful deliberation and score tallying, the results are out, although it's a clear winner. Uh, I now request Mr. Virendra Gill of Amazon Nautical Association to kindly come up on stage and distribute the prizes. So, I have much awaited results of this quiz. And can anyone please guess who stood third? Yes, team HIMT backed 18 points in this quiz. With that, they received the third prize. Congratulations to team HIMT.
Now moving on to the second prize. It is backed by Team Gems, G-E-I-M-S, with a score of 20 points. Just like the Great Institute, it was a great performance and they've backed 20 points. Now moving on to the first prize with 26 points in the quiz. It is Tolani Maritime Institute. Let's have a huge round of applause once again. There is a quote we say that the boys have made me proud. It's not only the boys, it's the girl who has also made me proud. So again, a huge round of applause for Rishika and Karthik. Very good evening to all of you, uh, Captain Kane, Captain Banerjee, uh, all the students, faculty. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm back with the Marine fraternity after something like 20 years. And to represent uh, Amazing uh, Nautical Association, it's an association which we have just started. Uh, it's a bunch of mariners who've come together. And the idea is to uh, get more people together from the old teams and to see what we can do to give back to society. Today's quiz, I must confess, had me floored in many of the questions. And uh, it just shows just how rusty old mariners can be as well. Having said that, I think my experience in shipping has really stood me proud and has been uh, something which really was able to stand me in good stead when I moved ashore 20 years ago. And what I would like to leave as a point which I want to mention to you all is, when you are at sea, safety is the most, uh, the fo foremost point that you focus on. The ship, the people, and basically the environment as well. And I think uh, when we come back to, to land, one of the things that we have, uh, we have to bring back with us is that sort of a concept. And if any of you are thinking of coming ashore, please bring that back. What we see in industry is a dire need for, for such things to be in place. Uh, but when you're at sea, always think of what are the improvements you will bring about to whatever systems are placed. My, what I recall about shipping is there were a lot of systems. And if the systems are there, they have to be improved. And I think that's where your focus should be. How do you keep improving? on what you have as you get on board a ship. You're there for six months, four months, whatever is the contract period. Keep doing that continual improvement and updating the SOPs there. So I think with that, and if you see the sort of uh, points, the questions that came up in, in the Transtech 22 quiz, I really feel that uh, it's a need to keep updating and ensuring that the environment is the real focus today. That's been one of the big issues that we are dealing with ashore. And I think shipping members coming back and being able to bring that alight is what I would say would be one of the big focus areas. So thank you all very much and all the best. I think a superb job done by the teams. Very close call and it was a most interesting quiz. Thank you. Now I would request Captain Manoj Hirkane to kindly present our guest with a token of appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now indulge in a short 10-minute tea break. The next session will resume at 16.47 hours. Thank you.
Cadets to settle down, let the faculties and the dignitaries leave first.
third the wheel safety system and the so let's see the demonstration of the Good day everyone, Arduino controller after a flame is include 360 degree camera with as the power propulsion is made by lightweight uh, lubrication and the time period Good day everyone, I am Cadet Hardwick with the third year. The detachment of the life work is done in two different ways. And the light will also glow. As the port propulsion and air lubrication system. Hello everyone, we are presenting a model on a Zypod propulsion with air lubrication system in the transport.